Let's do it. Where to start, indeed. Well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. I I put out a tweet a little while back and, and uh, seeing who wanted to come on for a chat. You chimed up with some topics that I'm sure you knew would pique my interest. And um, then you sent me a bunch of uh, or some writing that you did in Bitcoin Magazine and in Citadel 21, all of which were super interesting. So let's discuss. But maybe before we do, is there is there is there any introduction that an anonymous pseudonymous person wants to give or or should we just crack into the ideas? For sure. Um, well, I can tell a little bit about myself. So I'm known as Bitcoin Graffiti on Twitter. I guess that's how most of Twitter knows me. Um, in my spare time, I make graffiti stencils. I put them out in meat space. Basically for fun, um, I guess it was mainly born from, I guess, my rabbit hole journey. And I just was looking for a way to express myself also in a way I was feeling I needed to like close the gap between me as a new Bitcoiner and I guess the rest of normie land. So <laughs> that's basically how I got into that stuff. Otherwise, in, in my life, I'm an entrepreneur, software developer, and that's how I go around. Were you into graffiti prior to Bitcoin? No, completely not. So, so the graffiti it was, was just something that popped into your mind, inspired by, yeah, you know, the rabbit hole, basically. Basically, I was, well, this all happened during the pandemic. And I was also a bit angry, I guess. I was looking for a way to express myself. I was a bit fed up with how things were going. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I was just mainly looking for a way to express myself and also to have like, because Bitcoin is digital, right? So you don't really see it in daily life. So it was like, yeah, maybe sh some effort should be put in to like get it on the walls, have other people see it. Basically, it didn't really work for like the goal it was intended to do because I was like, okay, let's get a, this out in Normie land. But basically it was mostly seen by Bitcoiners and they really liked that. So, and I didn't realize until just kind of getting ready for this today, but I've seen the, the sailor get off zero stencil and the yeah. Dr. Evil one whole Bitcoin stencil that those are yes. both you, right? Correct. Are, are there other ones that like other stencils that you've used? Uh, th th those are the most popular ones. There's also uh, James Bond, Sean Connery one with instead diamonds are forever it's bitcoins are forever and yeah those those are the main the main ones yeah man it would be so cool to be walking down a street somewhere and see one of those stencils you know just plastered on the back of a stop sign or some alley wall or you know wherever really you know just see sailor you know with his serious face saying get off zero staring <laughs> back so at you <laughs> Yeah, and, and it is, and I always get good reactions from Bitcoiners because it always comes at a, as a surprise. And it's just, I guess, a nice way for a Bitcoiner to feel some recognition, I guess, or like have some reflection in the yeah. real, real world, you know, to see like, oh, hey, there's people out there thinking the same thing, you know? So, well, if you, if you walk by it's one, it's a you nice know, feeling. I think. Yeah. Inside or, you know, out, even you, you'd probably even say this, but you'd look at it and be like, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. You know, exactly. like, that's, that's, that's my shit. You should do one. Uh, what's another, I f maybe I haven't seen this. I feel like someone on Twitter may have put it together, but maybe I'm just dreaming it up, but like a, a sailor stencil with stack sats pussy. That's a a real pointed one as well, you know? Maybe that's do you do, do you have uh like more designs in, in the pipeline or is the is the biggest uh kind of task to just get them out and you know secretly put them down without anybody seeing you and that kind of thing? I mean I've had I have I definitely have some other designs, but I mainly see this as a hobby a fun thing to do so i'm only getting into it if i really feel to um and it's also like the design process i mean it, it takes some time um and also the act of uh putting them out on the streets is well depends where you do it but it's somewhat intense i'd mm. say because 
um, basically it's always a trade-off between having a place where you have good exposure and also, but it also means you're increasing the risk of perhaps getting caught or people calling the police, whatever. So it's, it's, yeah, you get your adrenaline up, I'd say. Um, sure. so, and then like you have to go out late at night too. So basically you just get back one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and then, yeah, you mess up your schedule a bit. So right. that's why I don't do it that often. It's always a sacrifice. Um, <clears throat> all right, well let's, let's get into actually, before we get into some of your writing, I think in, in one, in one of the messages you, you sent me, you said, I think prior to getting involved in Bitcoin, you were a, a squatter in Amsterdam. Yeah, that's correct. So what what does that mean uh, and and what was that experience like? The squatter mean homeless? Yeah, so no, so this used to be a thing in the Netherlands for quite a few uh decades. It was actually a legal thing to do, so there were laws in place that allowed people to do this and I'll I'll just start off at the beginning. So when I left my home when I was 18, Traveled the world for like two years, went to Australia, went to Canada. Um, then I lived in big cities. So I lived in Montreal for quite a while. And then I came back home and I was like, okay, well, then I want to live in the biggest city of the Netherlands. So I went to Amsterdam. Basically, Amsterdam has a big housing problem for many years. So it was really difficult to get in, uh, to, to find a room. And... Uh, Back, back then, I somewhere in, in a summer some time ago, I came into the position where I was like, okay, like I'm gonna have to leave this place. I don't have like a new place really to go to. It's difficult, it's expensive. So what I was looking for possibilities basically to like find find a place somehow, uh, which wouldn't like like would have me to like work like insane amounts of hours just to like finance my room you know so and then there are things in the netherlands there are agencies are called there are anti-squatting agencies which means they are doing exactly the opposite of squatting which I'll, I'll get into later uh basically i gave them a ring and i said like sir we only have uh, we have a waiting list of two or three years so it's like, okay, so this doesn't work too. And basically what they provide is um, you're, you're basically becoming a guard for an empty building. So you can live cheaply. You can live in a, like an empty space. So you have to do like a lot of things yourself, but basically you have no rights. So they will they can say to you within four weeks, okay, th this house will have like a new designation people will rent it and you're gonna have to get out of here and we're not sure we have like a next place for you so but basically they they didn't have anything so there was a waiting list for two years and this was anti-squatting so and then i was like well i'm running out of options now uh, so if this was anti-squatting what is actually the real squatting <laughs> so um i looked on the internet and there were some, like, let's say headquarters. Um, so every district district in Amsterdam had its own headquarters. So basically I walked in, in there one day and every week they have like some kind of um, cafe where you can ask your questions on like how to squat, what is it? What What is this thing all about? So I went in there one day and they explained to me like, how does this thing work? And basically what it comes down to in the Netherlands, it used to be legal that if a property was empty for over a year, you could basically start living there as long as there was no permit with it, no, no plans for it. And basically the whole squatting movement was arranged around that law. So the law said, for example, if you enter such a building, you're going to have to bring in a mattress, a table and a chair, and then this is a legit claim on the property. Basically, you would never become an owner, but you could you would have living rights. So you would be like a and these would be properties that there for whatever reason was no official owner. Well, they would always be owned, but they would be empty. So think of like a, an office space or an old factory or a farm. 
but sometimes also apartments. And, and they most of the time they were like speculation objects. So basically, most of the time actually was like owned by mafia type type guys, and they would be empty for some kind of weird purpose. So and those you could like take custody of, let's say, within the law, and start living there. And this was the scene back then in in Amsterdam. So wow. yeah, yeah, it's well, an interesting well, well, thing. Yeah, well, what was that like? I mean, how long did you do it? And so you just took over a, basically an empty space and lived there until you got on your feet, or tell me more. Uh, correct. So um, basically, they so I went in there that day and I I asked my questions. They explained it a bit and. They're quite organized, I would say almost like to a military kind of uh, level. It's like some kind of punk kind of um, movement, but very organized. And they basically gave me a manual that said like, okay, so this is basically how you do it. You're going to have to do your own research. You have to like cycle through the streets, take notes of all the empty places you see, build a long list of potential addresses, and then come back again the next day, check if they're still empty, cross them out if, if you see uh, somebody's actually living there. And then um, basically you end up with a few addresses, um, which are potential living places. And then the squatting movement actually has like a special team that's specialized in breaking off doors, uh, fixing locks. And you just replay, you, you enter the space, they open it, they change the locks. And from that point, you legally live there. So th this was quite a left-wing kind of uh, yeah. movement. I wouldn't say I would be part of this <laughs> t today, for sure. I've changed over the years, but uh, it was, a, let's say what I took from it, it was a, a, a subculture, let's say a, a punk culture, different way of looking at things and living and now in retrospect i'm I'm really like oh yeah maybe what i was doing was some somehow escaping the fiat ponzi perhaps and all this this crazy housing crisis we have here in the netherlands mm. which is not over by the way it's still pretty bad um yeah so that was that was part of what i did you, you mean home home prices and rent prices are still pretty bad that's what you mean yeah, I, I guess Netherlands is one of the countries with the highest housing prices. Yeah, definitely. Would would so it does sound kind of like a subculture sort of thing, but what was the environment out like outside of just that process of finding places where you could squat? Like, was it otherwise dangerous? Was there other sorts of criminality? Like, would would that bleed into theft of any kind, drug use, or was it basically no. just? A, a kind of a, a way to get a roof over your head and then everyone lives as normal a life as they can, I guess. Basically, and it was some some kind of like supportive uh, group also because it was basically strength in numbers. So it would sometimes happen that um, there were like backlashes or uh, mafia type owners would like send like a, a crew on on you you know to like evict the, the place and throw you out so you have to be prepared for stuff like that so you you would have to know like how to barricade your door um call in Holy like uh, troops and, and it happened one time on, on our squad it, like one of the first months um they sent like a repair crew or like a renovation crew on us and so we basically we had to barricade door we had to actually call the headquarters you know and and within ten minutes we had our own like show of force in front of the door. That's how well organized it was. So there was like a, a violence aspect to it to like really make sure not bad stuff wouldn't happen and they wouldn't try these these things. So yeah, it was a very interesting kind of uh, situation. And it, it's 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 done now in the Netherlands. I think in like two thousand eight they they made it illegal. So it's it's not a nothing anymore really. Wow. But th that used to be like. A, 40 years of uh, Dutch history, I guess, where this was allowed. Yeah. And how, how long were you in that situation for? About five years, I guess. Wow. I did that uh, for five years. Yeah. 
any other which was mainly i i lived in two spaces so one oh, that's not bad at all we, really Only no one we got evicted from yeah one we got evicted from quite quite soon and then we had an office space and we actually made like a, an agreement with the owner where we said like listen we're not here for any trouble if you have like potential renters um you know just call us uh we'll let them in and if you rent out this place we're gone so uh, that's basically the deal we had with him and uh, yeah we left there for five years so that was and what ultimately brought it to an end for you the the the, the law actually so they made it illegal, oh, I and I was like, "Okay, I don't want to be part of that." And what happened then? Like, where did you live after that? You just found a place where you pay rent. Yeah, my my girlfriend she she had a she had a place, so I, I moved in with her. Back in that time, she had like a large space, so that's how so, I. So would it would the squatting be totally free, or like is there can does everyone who's there make a contribution to be a part of the? system that you mentioned or no so so the squad is like you, you live there or like with the people you decide to live there and you basically just pay your energy bill um that's it wow interesting um and how you i think you men mentioned that you came into bitcoin in 2020 correct all yeah. right so tell me you know tell me your personal rabbit hole story before we get into the yeah, so typical rabbit hole maybe if, if we can definitely so if we continue on from the the squatting so i started quite late with my university so i started that after that squatting adventure i uh, got a master's degree in bioinformatics um in the meantime i also had a uh, i'm a math kind of guy so i actually had a, a tutoring enterprise running where i help students with their math during my studies and when I finished my degree, I really was thinking like, okay, so am I gonna go into research and do a PhD or am I gonna uh, continue being an entrepreneur? And actually I actually saw more value into uh, becoming an entrepreneur. So that's what I went for. And basically what I did is um, I sort of like digitized my math learning company and um, yeah, so I turned that into like an interactive website where people can learn how to do math, like a la Khan Academy, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's that's basically how I make my living. And that had been going fine for a while. And I was like saving some money. And then I was thinking like, okay, you know, perhaps I should like start looking into investing. And this was like late 2019 where i got interested in the stock market right and then well Good it was just a few months kind of. away from total apocalypse <laughs> which um made me question a lot of things and one of the few things that surprised me most was when the stock market went up but I, I asked myself I don't, I don't understand what's happening here how can that happen and then basically, I just studied a bit the bond market and the Federal Reserve, and then things started clicking. And I was like, oh my goodness, this thing is rigged. I need to get out of this, you know? <laughs> and then I, I quickly, after like a short deviation into gold and silver, I, I found Bitcoin. Yeah. Wow. And so prior to March 2020, you didn't even really have any interest no. in monetary history policy history of money how the system zero. works how the financial system works none of that zero wow because you know all things you know that march sell-off was intense but brief right and then we went into two years of just insane uh you know insane run-up in in all markets pretty much what what was it about that time that just piqued your interest to make you think like, I need to investigate what's going on here more. Was it just that everything had sold off and bounced back so quickly and you were like, you know, that something's, something's wrong here. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm a science guy. I'm really into math. And basically what disturbed me most is that I didn't get it. I didn't know why these moves were happening and, and why this was rebounding so much. And just so suddenly by, basically what the fed was doing i was like that 
from a like scientific or natural point of view or like engineering point of view, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so I just try to like figure out, so what are like the fundamentals governing this, you know? So basically I, I just studied mostly the bond markets and just asked myself questions like, how is it possible the interest rate can be at 0%? And basically my conclusion was, is that you can only have this situation if you have a player in the market that has got an infinite amount of money that can press these yields down. And then I guess from that point of view, it becomes very clear that this market is uh, rigged and manipulated. And then I guess the next step is like, okay, what am I going to do about that? And so how long, because, you know, a lot of people, including myself, identified these problems, you know, early 2000s, and the only real option was to become a a gold bug, a gold and silver bug, let's say. And you said that you went through that and ultimately found your way to Bitcoin. So it must have been a very quick pass through the precious metals phase. You know, how very quick was quick. it? A couple of months. What, what happened? <laughs> so you said like, okay, big, uh, gold and silver, sound money. This is the way we fix this, you know, and there's tons of people and resources that have been, uh, you know, espousing that thesis for many, many, many years. So how did you go from the precious metals to kind of seeing the light on Bitcoin? Yeah, good question. I think, so I mostly wasn't aware of Bitcoin also, like how it really works and what were the fundamentals behind it. Basically, I just like was ignorant about it. And I guess basically a meme dipped me in. I remember that. So there's this mean of Peter Schiff, like hiding beneath his desk with his the gold Terminator bars company. and the yeah. Terminator Bitcoin around the corner. And I asked myself, <laughs> like, dude, like you're a software developer. What are you doing with metals? You know? <laughs> and, and then I started studying Bitcoin more. And, and I guess my advantage was that I'm a programmer, so I could do some, um, programming i guess on bitcoin too so i looked into that and then like you get more of a grasp of what it is and you you really understand it like a fundamental level how it works um yeah and then the the switch was i guess from that point like i guess a quarter of my wealth i pushed into bitcoin and i guess full maxi i went basically when sailor came onto the scene in the fall. basically also explaining a bit my my stencil so it's also basically a tribute to him because in a way he really spoke my language as a as a scientist and what did me in there was that his framework or like part of the frameworks he used looking at it was uh seeing it as a paradigm shift so basically um saying that this is actually like more of a scientific revolution that we had back in the 1600s when we switched from like geocentric model to heliocentric model mm -hmm. and that, that made so so much kind of sense because i also studied uh, philosophy of science university and that was like one of my favorite subjects which was a rare thing most people really uh, hated that topic i remember and i loved it so much and then when he started like throwing out these terms of like paradigm shift. And I was like, Ooh, like he's using like Kunian theory now. And that was my favorite thing. And, and then I was like, Oh, right. That explains everything. That's, that's explaining why people have so much trouble, um, uh, like really understanding Bitcoin and the resistance to it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the right framework. Now I get it. And basically that's, that's when I pushed all the chips in. Was there a shitcoin phase? Mm, basically not. No. Wow. No, I went Impressive. straight to Bitcoin. Man, but that's I'm thanks just... to all the education, I guess, that that's out there today. And I say Sailor spoke my language, so I, I understood what he was saying. So that that really helped me. Yeah. I wonder really how helped. many people, not only that he's brought into Bitcoin, but saved from going down that route. You know, because of the language he uses and how well, how brilliant he is at articulating a lot of these ideas. 
Yeah, and I guess everybody needs a different kind of language, but for yeah. sure, I'd say that was my language and the stuff I needed to hear, for sure. Matt, as, as you're saying this, I'm just thinking like, wow, to have gone through the full gamut of like being introduced to Bitcoin to being like a, you know, full-blown maxi in two years, what a what a full-on intellectual journey that must have been or must, you know, and in many cases probably still is. Totally. And I, and I have to say the the first couple of months were like sort of sickening a bit. Like <laughs> I was like, I was like, ex like basically your whole value system is being burned down to the ground and built up new again. So I was a bit dizzy, I guess, the first couple of months and like trying to like figure out, okay, what's going on exactly. And then I just like got rid of a whole new way of valuing the world. And now I'm like on a Bitcoin standard suddenly but no it felt very natural and it was the right choice but it it takes a while to like get grounded in it i guess and yeah well it's, it's also it's quite a change well exactly and and so and it's change on such a changes i guess on such a fundamental level um you know many of us often reflect back on you know we refer to it as our fiat selves right and it it seems to be a clear there seems to be a clear delineation or difference between the former self that was both seeing the world through, you know, fiat money, but also only contending with the fiat world as it was, let's say, versus now being able to see through a different lens. And, and as a result of that, being able to see through the world as it is and to a world that could be as a result of changing out the, you know, the base layer monetary standard. And that is, that is a, tremendously personal transformation that takes place. And, you know, I, it's one of the things that I discuss a lot with people, um, both on this show and in private and exploring writing and stuff like that, because, you know, that's really all there is, right? Like the world is how you perceive and what you experience it. And if that doesn't change, then well, what's the big deal? You know, nothing really has changed if, if how you see and act doesn't change and just, um, and seeing how, prevalent it is and how how common it is that making that switch and being able to see how things work on this fundamental level and having a tool now that allows them to work differently and we would all assert better how powerful um an impetus for transformation that is and you know again i i bring a smile to my face to hear to imagine you having gone through it in such a because two years isn't a long time for the type of change we're talking about right for having your kind of whole or a lot of your worldview and your perspective and your philosophy on life and so many other things be dramatically changed in that period of time. I mean, it's a lot of change to integrate, especially when you have 20, 30, 40 years prior to that, where you've had your perspective become hardened in many ways rather than, you know, tr uh, transformed. And so it's a very significant shift and it definitely, it feels amazing, but I can appreciate why it's it can be disruptive for a time until you figure out how to really, as you said, ground it in, you know, ground it so that you can move forward, uh, you know, confidently with it. Yeah, correct. Correct. It's, it's a, it's a big, big change. And like I said, this was part of the expression also with the Bitcoin graffiti, because I was going through such a, such a change. And I was like looking for like this, like recognition, I guess, within others also and like, does this make sense, you know, because your worldview is like totally different somehow. And like, basically it's just like the matrix scene, you know, like you're violent, violently being unplugged suddenly and you have to, you're being dragged down through the drains, you know, and like somebody picks you up again and they need to like work on your muscles and work on your view, right? Like you yeah. haven't used your eyes yet. This is basically the metaphor. So yeah, it, it's it was a rough, violent period. I'd say the the rabbit hole can be violent, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I switched. Definitely. Hmm. Yeah the the even prior to Bitcoin, you know, as, as I was trying to figure out as much as I could about how things work and you know how I wanted to be and what I wanted to pursue and all that stuff, and I I, I started kind of. Um, what's the right way to put it, perceiving or thinking that I was perceiving, you know, many faults in the system that 
seem to be going unnoticed by most people. Um, my, and as you say, I mean, that, that can be uncomfortable on many levels, especially prior to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is such a powerful tool to rectify those issues that you might be seeing, that it emboldens you, right? It, it, it instills hope. But prior to Bitcoin, if you're looking out on the world and you are starting to, you know, to borrow the metaphor, see through the matrix, well, it can be very depressing. It can be isolating. It can be um, you withdraw into your you, you you risk withdrawing into yourself because you feel like you're seeing problems and nobody else is seeing them, and so you might feel like you're you know, you're a little bit crazy or, you know, it's just, and, and and that isolating feeling is usually borne out in these stories that explore this metaphor. You know, you mentioned, or you referred to, I think in the Wizard of Oz piece, which we'll dig into now in a second, and how Neo in the Matrix, like the, the whole way they characterized that character prior to him being unplugged was with all of that imagery and with the props and with the, even the, the tone of the 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 film or the visuals in that part of the in part in that the gray part of the world. worlds yeah exactly yeah. the 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 world is gray and it's isolated and it's alienated and um so absent bitcoin that can be a very challenging thing to encounter but then once bitcoin arrives on the scene and you can see you you feel that you now have something that not only allows you to see more of that kind of pierce through the ma matrix even more but and not only just give you a tool to that can help to rectify those problems and therefore give you a sense not of you know despair and hopelessness but hopefulness um but three which you know perhaps is one of the, the most amazing parts of it all is that so many others are converging on the same tool and the same realization and the same mindset and the same perspective on it and so that you can connect with them and you can you know build communities companies share ideas, talk about things, zero in more on the truth, you know, because, you know, one of the things that kind of toys with people when they're in this position, and certainly when I was in it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, is like, you're seeing all this stuff and you're reading about all the corruption and the military industrial complex and the fucked up financial system and the fucked up pharmaceutical system and all the different, you know, the, the Illuminati, like all the things, right? All the things that you dig into when you're trying to figure out like what's fucked up with the world and whose fault is it? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, what's the way to put it? It's, it, you're not, you, of course you're not sure if it's real or not, if you're, if you're right or not, like, you, cause you ask yourself, am I, surely it can't be this way. You know, I can't, I can't be right about all this and, and definitely you're not. Um, and which is why, like when you, when people come together around a perceived solution, as we think we're doing with Bitcoin, at the very least, you have so many more kind of uh, feedback mechanisms or so many more people to share your, what you're seeing and your ideas with to try to see how much of it, you know, might be valid, your perspective might be valid and, and which ones, you know, you're off base and you need to, you need more feedback, you need more information to try to figure out how to refine that perspective so that it is more grounded in truth. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of those people that just characterize the world as one big giant conspiracy against them. And even if that were true, and I don't think it is, but even if it was, it's not a very helpful perspective to engage the world and you know have a a happy, fulfilling life. Um, but and but to those people, oftentimes it becomes consuming, and it you know it takes so much of their life away from them. And it's so great now to be able to mix it up with so many people that not only help you refine that perspective and 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 ground it in greater truth, but are doing so with a hopeful, with an energetic, with an enthusiastic, with a comedic attitude to it all and um you know and this is why we bitcoin right because uh we're, we're, we're trying to build better lives for ourselves and and contribute to a better world and do so um do so in a way that feels good right that's as i've said before like if we're not having some fun what's what's the point of all this yeah correct and, and i guess now in 2022 there is a bitcoin support group uh let's say out on the internet mm. so i guess the speed of um, which people can learn this and, and get into it and not think they are 
crazy, but actually the point of view they're taking is actually a logical one is, is, has matured, you know, um, I guess back in 2013, this bear market, I, that bear market, I guess it was way more difficult because there, the support group just wasn't there. So I guess that, that that's an important part. But on the other hand, I think we should also like look at it from a larger perspective that actually we're moving through quite a change, actually. If 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 Bitcoin is going to be, let's say, the, the the center of economics in the future and not fiat, this is a big change, you know, and, and perhaps stories um, or like uh, history can help us in explaining it be better because I'm, I often wonder also like how must Copernicus and Galileo have felt back mm -hmm. in their time when they were like the 0.01% that believed in the heliocentric model, you know, like that must have been pretty bad too. And that must have been such a clown world too, where the Catholic church was like, like behaving in such a terrible manner and was like basically on the verge of collapse. But that, that must have been a crazy period too. So I guess bringing back such a story is also like insightful, I guess, that whatever Bitcoiners going through and the, the clown world they're experiencing currently is perhaps exactly normal perhaps uh, at this stage of Bitcoin's development also. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think perhaps that's why so many in Bitcoin are, and this is probably true, but I'll say perceived to be disagreeable, right? Because in a sense, if you're the one to, to be willing, it's one thing to see what you think to be either the faults in the world or to perceive a, a an upgraded truth in, in the case of, let's say, Copernicus. But it's entirely another thing to put your neck out, you know, to risk your neck for it, to, to not only to see it, but to tell others that you see it and you believe it and you stand by it and you're going to orient your your perspective and your life by it. That's quite another thing. And, um, you know, in, in, in their time, they risked, you know, being banned, thrown in jail, burned at the stake, whatever. And so, you know, you really have to be strong in your convictions in our times you know, perhaps the consequences are less, but there's still ridicule, social isolation, censorship, fired from jobs. I mean, the last two years, especially put a lot, put a spotlight on the the downsides of sticking to your convictions and doing what you think is right and not allowing anyone to, to push you off your position. Um, and, you know, thank God for those people, because to your point, it might be the case that it's always, um, Clown, clown world or, you know, the insanity of the masses is just how it works, right? And, you know, the, the, the mass is always thinks like the mass. And then there's a few who stick their heads up and, and see the world differently and try to make the world different. And some of them get squashed back down and some of them make it through and uh, they don't get, you know, uh, strung up or burned at the stake and they become heroes, you know, sometimes during their life, sometimes uh, post-mortem. Um and maybe that's just the, the the way that social you know humanity and the social dynamic will always work like i i do think i do think bitcoin will ameliorate that situation if nothing else because i i think it's going to produce a world with far less distortion in in the signals that everyone orients their perspective by and so hopefully that means uh, people would be, it would be more difficult to lead people astray. It'll be more difficult for people to fall victim to their own biases and prejudices and things like that. But, you know, there's always a, a Pareto dis distribution, for example, you know, there's always going to be people that are seeing things clearly that have above average disagreeableness or courage or what have you. And that's just in relative terms going to make the other 80% seem like they don't have those things. And so th there's probably always going to be that tension between, you know, the innovators and the, and the the masses, let's say, and innovators is too narrow, but you know what I mean. Um, so who knows? But yeah, I mean, what do you think? Actually, <laughs> I shouldn't say who knows. What do you think? How do you think that dynamic? Well, is play I, out? I, I guess it basically also what you describe is really about what is it to be an individual or be mm. being a sovereign individual, and I guess being an individual will, in most cases turn out to be your perception changing that a lot of other people aren't, which right. 
right. maybe shows itself as a form of uh, a clown world or conformism. Um, and it's and and also, let's say if we're moving more into like perhaps the sovereign individual thesis, I guess we're also at a point perhaps where um, let's say the nation state is really working towards like maintaining itself and like doing its best, like perhaps to uh, survive and keeping people on their side or on board. And I guess that's really strong currently at, at this point. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess we're also seeing that. I, I, I guess if you look back 30 years ago, it wasn't that crazy as it is now, which I guess is like an indication that it's like, it, it's sort of coming to an end also. So yeah yeah maybe it's coming to an end i mean we shall see i always it's hard not to like scroll, scroll through twitter for five minutes and think surely we must be at peak clown world but you know then you wake up the next day and you scroll again and it's like i've it's been outdone once again you know so who knows but i because you 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 brought up the the situation you know around copernicus and the kind of dominance of and power of the church in in that period and now we have the dominance and, and power of the state. And it's like, well, what dynamics led to the so-called masses attributing you or, or following that power? And, you know, perhaps there's there's probably a lot of very simple answers to that. But one of them definitely is, well, that's kind of the nature of authority. It's like it it forces you to follow its dictates, its lead. And so if, whether it's the church or whether it's the church with its supposed monopoly on spirituality and to the degree that people, you know, believe in that, then they ascribe power to that institution. And of course, it also has very real physical power to enforce, you know, the things that it was attempting to enforce. And then the state, um, by virtue of its ability to effectively siphon or, or steal the wealth of people, has a tremendous amount of of power and force. And so there's a strong incentive to go along with its dictates one so that you're not you know you're not the nail to its hammer but two so you don't have to deal with the 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 psychological stress of knowing that you're basically a, a, of 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 perceiving um the psychological stress of knowing that you'd rather be doing something else but you're forced to do it because of the the power dynamic that you exist within and so you you acquiesce you you kind of fall victim to a a stockholm syndrome sort of thing where you kind of love your captor because that's easier psychologically than just being in that constant tension of thinking that you know you are a captive and you'd rather be doing something and again like it's most likely we 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 still have that kind of Pareto distribution of the mass and those people that see things differently and stick their heads up every now and then, even in a Bitcoin era. But it will be interesting when it'll be interesting to see where, if and where there is a central dominant authority, right? Because the premise is, is that there's going to be a lot more distribution of power because people won't be able to be stolen from. You won't have these big behemoth bureaucracies, political apparatuses, you know, and a question that I am often intrigued by is like, well, what happens to the monopoly on violence? What happens to the role of force in society when wealth cannot be redistributed arbitrarily, when people, when the cost of preserving your wealth or protecting or defending your wealth is basically zero for everyone. And so there, at a minimum, I would, I would think we're going to have that central authority is going to be much, much, much less powerful than it is today. And so that should mean that the degree to which people develop a cognitive dissonance in relation to the dominant authority in society would be diminished for, for that reason. But presumably there's still going to be some role for force in society or for the use of, of coordinated violence, let's say. And um, I guess those are two separate issues, but um, I'm always intrigued by, or I, I haven't come to a satisfactory perspective on what the role of force and violence will be from a central authority in the future should it exist you know so maybe maybe you can touch on what your thoughts are on that well i for sure have like a theory more on like why most people still would believe in that story or like have an 
authority because I'm an entrepreneur. And I guess from my point of view, it's different because I think most people, if, if you have like nine to five job, if you're getting a paycheck every month, the dynamics of the system are not, um, let's say, very clear to you, like how this whole thing works. I guess when you're an entrepreneur, you're more close to the forces of nature and economics. And I think you're dealing more with uh, reality, let's say. And I guess a simple uh, thing one could say about the world is that it's basically run by entrepreneurs. Whatever the government would like to say, government is mainly running on uh, uh, taxing the entrepreneurs, right? And I guess if you're an employee, um, you you see less of that. It's like sort of like more veiled yeah. to you. So like you're you're f- a bit further away from nature or the truth, I would say, which I guess would make it harder to uh, grasp also like really what what is going on and how does this system actually work. So I, I think that has its role to play, I guess, with uh, people figuring uh, this this out or not. And I think also people need to be in distress, I guess, to like, uh, or like, or perhaps need to experience a state of shock in order to like switch their uh, point of view, perhaps. And if for a lot of people still things are like sort of okay, there's not much reason to like question how things um, are. And with respect to authority, I guess like it's basically an easy thing, right? So um, basically you, you don't have to take responsibility to like have your own view of the world, come up with your own ideas and basically just play with the game. And, and I guess as long as it works, there's not really an incentive for people to change their minds. Uh basically Mm -hmm. so um, it could i think it's also true that it actually is because you as far as in in this dynamic that we're exploring as far as the people are concerned the authority is the truth whether it's the church whether it's because they create they are the most influential thing in constructing the environment that you have to engage with in order to meet your ends to satisfy your your wants or whatever and so there's there's this it's almost like the approach is correct you should try to conform with the truth as much as you can but i think the danger is is um doing that to well false idols you know let's say to to conforming to something that seems authoritative that seems truthful but is in fact not it's deriving its authority you know via illegitimate means let's say and what's really interesting with bitcoin you know and this kind of gets to the deeper layers of the the rabbit hole or the metaphysical aspects of bitcoin it's like what what attributes are built into bitcoin or allows it to to be as successful as it is or allows it to even operate as it is and it may very well be the case that the principles and values that that do so are kind of metaphysically true like the 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 values and principles like freedom and like fairness and like truth itself and like you know even something like love like are these not constituent components of this system and if they are and if you know and and were they not intended to be built into them such that everyone could be treated with those same principles, you know, so everyone that that engages in the system is 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 treated the same effectively. And so if people, if we always default to, you know, kind of um, cohering or adhering to the authority, because it is the environment, it, it's a supposed environment that we have to operate in to achieve our aims, then it's legitimate. The problem is, is, is the environment itself legitimate or not? And so in the case of perhaps the, you know, overbearing religious authority or an overbearing government or bureaucratic authority, you might say no, but what if the authority itself now becomes far more deeply true, far more representative of ideas or principles or values that are, are far more deeply true. And that 
you know, critically cannot be co-opted or commandeered or, or ruled by any one individual person for any narrow ends of any kind. So what if, what if you're now contending with an authority or environment that is deeply true to the extent that we can conceive of it and no, and not funneling, not using that power or authority to any one particular person's ends. And so everyone can avail of the same sort of benefits from that authority. Then maybe we, we, it really does produce a situation that's different than what has historically been the case. You know, I'm, I'm very wary about suggesting we're going to shrug off, um, just the way things have been for so long. Cause as you, you know, I think many people have pointed out, there'll always be a distribution of some kind, right? There's going to be different people that are motivated differently, that are bestowed with different natural attributes and talents. And there is no, you know, everyone is equal and we don't want that. So, you know, most likely it'll be the case that there's always a masses and there's always the select few that do things differently and push things forward and bring everything to a new level. But that said, it's really intriguing question about what happens when everyone actually is interfacing with a form of truth that is more deeply true and and impervious to corruption than anything else that's ever served as the authority in the past. What does that produce? And that's like a really interesting open question. Correct. Yeah. And we're going to have to see like how that's going to develop and, and perhaps also to put it a bit more in perspective, like I, I guess the nation state used to work a lot better perhaps in the past, perhaps it was like more um, effective at doing its thing. Right. So like if, if we look back at the sovereign individual thesis, where it actually like it, it grows like it grows from this feudal system and the church uh, situation and the way society was formed back then, and then trans transitions into more citizenship. I guess for like the the technology that was around there, it was like a the best working mechanism that could be found. Uh, that could be found. Mm -hmm. But I guess uh, with the microprocessor or or like let's say bitcoin built on top of that like this is changing the game and now finally we have the technology to like move away from what was suboptimal but used to work better in the past so like i i won't like let's not fully condemn it the previous situation but mm -hmm. I, I i guess we can say like it currently it is an anachronism and it's not functioning anymore yeah and and this is I think that's a great point. And part of the reason why paradigm shifts are are so hard to spot and so and uh well at least in the early stages, most people don't see it, is because the the new paradigm that's available is completely unprecedented, right? And so you're right. It's a, and and I agree that's why we shouldn't spend too much time criticizing the state of the world or how we got here because it's entirely irrelevant and it may be the case as you said that we couldn't have done much better with the tools at our disposal but now we have a different yes it was of... it was perhaps the natural way things had to evolve right and now it's moving into a different direction made by technology yeah yeah so we, you know we should focus on that rather than being too <laughs> upset about you know the state of the clown world and i know I think that's the approach most of us take. I mean, you can't help but you know point it out and laugh at it from time to time. But when there's so much positive potential on the horizon now as a result of this new tool, this new paradigm, it would almost be silly to focus too much on on condemning the past because again, now now it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but just to I don't know if I, if we if I lost you on this point, uh, like if you dropped out, but. What do you think, and I, I'm sorry to come back to this, but what do you think will be the role of coordinated force or violence in a Bitcoin-denominated world? As in what will happen to the to the nation state, you mean? How uh, that will look uh, like? Yeah, I mean, I guess in the, in, in the current context, but even if we don't have, like if we go to a city-state model, a citadel model, a who knows what model, what will be the role of coordinated violence or force? 
I haven't spent too much time on that. Time thing, yeah. I, I no, I, I I wouldn't know. Like somewhere, the the city state model makes sense, I guess, because a lot of assets and people with digital assets for sure will be able to to move and they'll, they'll you know they'll they'll move out of these um predatory jurisdictions but like i'm not sure how many people can actually do that you know like most people are still like tethered to their own country or they have a business there or they have their work there so they won't be they won't leave easily you know mm -hmm. so and i guess this is like the the force that um can undermine the nation state like it's like getting rid of their tax base right so like if, if entrepreneurs decide to move like okay we're now gonna go off into a more favorable jurisdiction there they're gonna do that depends also like where you want to live i guess like the united states is like perhaps easier to like move around to but uh, otherwise the hurdles are a bit like larger i think and and maybe it needs to like uh, come to a point where it's like it's getting so crazy and the cost of living is increasing that much that, that people will make that move but yeah it might need to like come to like a, a shock point for a lot of people where they might like decide otherwise but like th that's that's if like the the system like will not like hold anymore and will only get crazier and nastier but like uh, hopefully that doesn't happen but yeah I, I don't know how that will transition how that's gonna work out yeah nobody does all right let's talk about um the wizard of oz a little bit because you that's you good. wrote a really interesting article about it and i had heard somewhere before that um that someone had made the the association between the Wizard of Oz and like a, a story of monetary history or or like a monetary narrative or of some kind. Um, and then I had the the you linked to a YouTube video of what's the guy's name who does the documentary about this you know the Federal Bill Reserve. Still Bill Still. Uh, I had seen that like long time ago. I think it's from the early '90s, maybe or possibly even earlier. Um, but it. it and is there any indication that Baum himself, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, like, is there any evidence that he was thinking about the story in monetary terms? Or are we just, because stories, all stories are true and some are like true in a broader sense. And so by virtue of the structure of how our, you know, consciousness works and all of that, like we, we tend to well, we see the world in narrative. And so we tend to be able to graft many narratives on one particular story. And that's why stories can have so many different interpretations. Um, and, it, you know, when you flesh it out, as you do in your piece, like there, it's so apt, right? It's just so perfect. But I'm curious, is there any evidence that Baum himself was attempting to tell a monetary story or narrative here, like, you know, on the sly? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, from my point of view i would say 100 percent yes this was his intent uh but i've researched it a bit and i couldn't find any straight evidence towards it so like i could be like fully hallucinating here <laughs> uh but the symbolism used is so apt and like it works totally that i'm like yeah this must have been his intent uh, at least the uh, it is a monetary story uh, for sure, because also pointed out in this Bill Still documentary, it, it also depicts the the history of the United States within that uh, epoch. So there, there were like banking issues back then. This was still pre uh, Federal Reserve, and so so there are uh, sim there's symbolism used that like really points to where like specific parts in American history. And uh, but the I think the mythological layer on this story, um, yes, speaks for itself and, and and doesn't need those historical references. Um, I think so. Bill still mostly goes into the historic aspect of it, and what I did was more use it as a, like a 
story narrative. And, and I always like to explain it because I also like to like approach it from the mythological point of view. Um, because, for example, the, the Greeks, they, they thought the world could be split in two ways. So if you cut it, then you get two things. Logos, so facts, and mythos, uh, like the narrative or the, the story. And I always find that's like such a rich way to look at uh, things because currently in today's society, uh, myth has become analogous with falsehood and uh, yeah being false and the same goes for fairy tale like when people say like oh yeah well that that's a fairy tale and they they mean with that like oh that, that mustn't must not be true whereas like from the greek point of view it was like uh, uh real it was reality or like what what jordan peterson would say it's a hyper real you know mm. it's it, it's the abstraction and you get a like good look at it what it's what's really happening so I, I really like to use the mythological uh, framework to like analyze that. And also for, for Bitcoin, so there's a lot of, uh, let's say, Logos analysis and Logos books, like technical explanations of what is Bitcoin. But I guess The Wizard of Oz provides, a, yeah, like a narrative for what, what some money does and what it is. Yeah, well, I mean... I think many of us can appreciate, and we touched on it at the beginning of this uh, conversation, that Bitcoin, going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole kind of represents the ultimate hero's journey in many ways. I mean, it's, it's just such an archetypal or quintessential hero's journey sort of experience. And maybe the first that many of us have experienced in our lives. You know, life itself, I think you, you could say broadly is a hero's journey, but this one is so condensed and, and perhaps overt. But is it is it too big a question for me to ask you, like, you know, to interpret or, or what your 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 main thesis is on the Wizard of Oz in both the the logos and the mythos sort of telling. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we could could run through the story, um, but yeah, let's like, do it. I might, but I would say my end thesis is that perhaps it's um, depiction of what it means, perhaps to have some some money and what it does to your psyche and uh perhaps it shows like um the journey into like, like becoming an individual perhaps so but maybe let's run through the story and we can like pick out the symbolism uh that was used so uh let's start first that this is about the book and not the movie right and uh they're the story is really different. The symbolism is mostly intact in in the in the book form, and it basically starts out where Dorothy, the hero, starts out in Kansas, and everything and how she experiences the world, everything is gray. So I would say like she's at her point where she's uh, living through life uh, and experiencing it as like nihilism, right? Right, the color has disappeared. From it and we alluded to this before with the matrix where the introduction of that movie is like it's shot for like the green lens and it was partially based i guess to like say like okay you're still like in a matrix but it uh you know there's also a scene in the matrix where like he opens that book and it's and it says like on nihilism right what what, so, what scene was that I, I when i read that i was like i didn't notice that in the yeah movie. so like these, these these types knock on his door right and they invite him to the party and like he gives out like a, a disc or something yeah yeah and he basically opens a book which is like simulation and simulacre or something it's called and basically that was the movie the movie was based on that and all the actors had to read that book and uh it's it's like a hollowed out copy yes and and the disc is inside and when he opens it the, the chapter reads on nihilism wow. so i think they really want to like get through it like okay this is his life and he's completely at the point of maximum nihilism here right. and like something needs to like shift you know like he's looking for a way out perhaps out of this situation and th the same perhaps could be said for dorothy um who then gets up in like a sort of inverse kind of rabbit hole right so let's say in alice in wonderland she, which was written before uh, frank Baum's book i, I guess it also influenced his work, I think. But basically, like she's like being spinned up 
inside the tornado, right, and into a cyclone. So one could say, like, okay, this is again perhaps the rabbit hole towards uh, the unconsciousness or the the like the, the fantastical uh, world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are like some uh, similarities, and basically, yeah. So then she lands into this magical land and they say and she meets the fairy and she says like well if you want to get home you need to see the wizard of oz he lives in emerald city and you just need to follow the yellow brick road and whilst that she arrives in the country she kills the witch which was like the, the house crashed on this witch and she adopts her silver shoes so basically what we have there is like she has the silver shoes and she's walking on the yellow brick roads. I mean, the roads of gold. So basically the symbolism there is saying like, okay, the path to go, the way to walk is by adopting the, uh, the precious metals, right? So the silver and the gold, and that's the road you need to take adopting sound money. And then, before, we, b before we go on from there, I'm just curious, what do you yeah. think the significance of, is landing on the witch like that's how you enter the fantastical world yes well so basically what dorothy wants is she wants to uh, come back home that's that's her permission and basically the shoes she gets from this witch allows her to do it but so basically from the get-go she has already the power to go home Right. She so she, correct. So the thing is, she needs to figure it out whilst she's going on this journey. So the journey is somehow necessary. And uh, basically, it also says, like, from that point on, you, you possess a power already that is uh, perhaps also given. So, like, if you analyze the, her name, Dorothy, you can go two ways, I guess. One, it really means God. It's God's gift or God given, so it it's alluding to something you already have inside that no authority can give you. You already have that, mm. right? Or you or you could go like Dorothy, maybe towards French. It also means gold, like door. So maybe both ways go. So I guess it's pointing towards that that like you already have inside all the things you you want it you just need to figure it out whilst going on the journey and perhaps some money adoption helps in that process because it will clear up your world let's say or like you're on the right value system you can make the right decisions now right right makes perfect sense to me okay c c continue. yeah to me too but like <laughs> <laughs> but we're a bunch so of retarded she... bitcoin people so yeah yeah so <laughs> So then she goes on the road and she unlocks these characters, let's say. So the first one is a scarecrow. I would say this is the consciousness. So if you read the book, but by the way, it's available freely on uh, gutenberg.org. So you can download it for free. Um, basically, when you read it, um, when you first uh, present this character, uh, the scarecrow says when his creator or the farmer that put him there on the field, uh, he started to see when his eyes were drawn by the farmer on his face. And he could start to speak after the farmer had drawn his mouth on his face. And I always found, found that interesting why he went for that, because in a way, uh, I think what the scarecrow depicts is awareness actually so yeah so like it's he's almost like a a, a buddhist kind of uh, symbol that that he's using here so like once you have the eyes you can see once you have your mouth you can finally talk and that's also like how scarecrow acts so what scarecrow wants is he wants a brain because he thinks his brain is all made of straw but if you read through his dialogue and how dorothy interacts with him you actually come to know he's you he's already smart he's he already has a lot of wisdom let's maybe let's say a farmer's wisdom like very logical natural kind of 
logic sense yes mm. so basically scarecrow wants a brain from the wizard of oz but he also doesn't know actually he's already smart and he'll figure it out later because wizard of oz has got nothing uh, to give him right so i look at scarecrow as being the symbol for perhaps the awareness and it will make more sense once we get further down the road um, and then afterward, she basically also unlocks the Tin Woodman, which is more of like the perhaps the archetype or like the symbol for sensitivity, perhaps. And then the lion courage. So uh, let's say summing up along this journey, she tries to integrate the awareness, sensitivity, and courage into her character because. I also look at it like this. You could look at them as all separate entities and characters, but basically this, this is all playing out in the unconsciousness of someone. These are all psychological entities of yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So this whole crew is going towards Emerald city and ask the wizard of Oz to like bring Dorothy home. And then interesting, this is my favorite scene of the whole book, I think. When they come up to the gates of the green city, I'd say Fiat city, green the fake city, right. yeah. exactly in the middle of the, so, and the, and the Emerald city is in the middle of the country. So they knock on the door and then there's the gatekeeper and it's like, okay, yeah, sure. I can let you in, but we need to do two things before you can enter. One is everybody will have to wear green glasses. And we're going to lock them at the back so you can't take them off, right? So from that point, they all see, they only see green. And then the next step they take is, uh, it's written in the book, there's a big golden key hanging on a peg on the wall. Hanging on a and peg, they, that's the word they use? On a peg, exactly. <laughs> and and I was like, this is 100% on purpose because <laughs> why would you hang it up? You would hang such a thing on a hook, not a peg. But right. of course, you're taking gold off the pack, right? To get into fiat lands. Gold mm -hmm. needs to be off the pack. <laughs> so <This is> perfect. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's like, so you asked me, was this his intent? I would say 100%. This is, this makes, right. like, you can't make this up. Okay. And, and from that point, they're wearing their green glasses into the city, which is such a nice symbolism. I think that that's the best part of the book, I think, because I guess normie world is that, you know, they haven't yet uh, taken off their green glasses, basically. So mm -hmm. the value system is green, right? So this is the world, you, you perceive the world through dollars, through the fiat currency. And what needs to happen is they need to like, need to take them off. This is the problem. So, and then um, they visit us. They basically, he makes false promises to them. He, he cannot give the Tim man his heart, the line his courage. He cannot send Dorothy home and he cannot uh, give the scarecrow his brain. And well, first they're going to send it off to like kill the Wicked Witch of the West. Later they come back and they figure out it's a scam. Oops. Uh, but don't so but first doesn't he say he yeah. will give them those things if he kills of, the witch? of course and exactly and then they come back and they figure out he can't and wait, 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 they wait, figure wait, out he's wait, just wait, a man wait. behind don't, the curtain don't, right? don't skip over the so they they still after going through this journey they meet the wizard that you know and they think he's this all-powerful being he agrees to their requests if they kill the witch right and then they go and they find the witch and they kill her with water and what's the significance? Yeah, they liquidate of that? her. They liquidate her. Well, I think this is more into this is more a historic reference. I think, unless you have you have better ideas on that, I I couldn't find mythological uh, meaning in that. But I think they had some like problems with banks in the West and something because in the movie they also say when they throw the bucket of water on her that eventually kills her. In the movie they say like. Oh, we've liquidated her. And I was like, that's mm -hmm. such a strange word choice, you know, for right. a, a kid's novel. So there was obviously a, some kind of liquidation event happening <laughs> there. 
but I, I I don't know too much about the significance. But if you have ideas, I'd, I'd like to know them. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, be, beyond just kind of the use of a financial reference to uh, for the destruction of something, let's say, uh, I'm, I, nothing's coming immediately to mind. So they they do that, and then they go back to the wizard, and and then you you continue on with picking up the story. Correct. So like they figure out he's just a guy uh behind the curtain basically incapable of giving them anything so they, he cannot fulfill their wishes and then uh, i think dorothy makes a deal with him that uh, they're gonna fly back on his balloon uh, so she can go back to where she came from back to kansas then something goes wrong he flies away but this was also a interesting point i think is that the Wizard of Oz is depicted as a balloonist, right? And so he's good. Right? He's good. He's exactly. So uh, we skipped a bit over that part, but first he represents himself as different beings. So like a, a big head, um, some other shapes and forms. He shows himself before they figure out it was just a man behind the curtain. Um, so like he's a venture locus, so he's, so he's a, he speaks from his stomach. So there, I thought there was like an inflation, uh, thing going on there. And eventually he escapes the Emerald city by inflating a big green balloon. Well, this makes sense, doesn't it? So like, let's say if the wizard of Oz would be like uh, a central banker, like basically you're only good at one thing right is is blowing inflating things so if he escapes in a green balloon that makes total sense right because mm -hmm. at the core of the society we have an inflationist right mm -hmm. so but eventually so he flies off uh, he's gone and then actually scarecrow is taking over the city which for me was an argument for the fact that perhaps this is more of like the the awareness. So like, if you now start to look at it from a personal perspective. So if you believe in like this whole fiat thing and in inflation thing, basically that's at the core of your being also, right? So if you think that's true, then basically at somewhere in your psyche, there's a lie. There's something is not correct. You haven't uh confronted uh that's yeah that's a falsehood actually so this is part of dorothy's journey she's confronting with this fakeness she's like really checking out is this thing real can i get from this guy really what i want because she's they're treating him as an authority right because they think oh he's the one who can give us all these things we want but mm -hmm. the true lesson is actually Ah, we already had those things, but we were relying here on an authority. And instead of having the authority at the center of you, there should be the awareness that should be the center of you. That's like a, a more that's like the proper alignment, I guess, what you want in if you want to become an individual, right? Right. Like you need to see the world from your point of view. You shouldn't have an authority telling you how we should think and behave. The, the authority should be the source of truth within you, effectively. Yes. Yeah, it should it should be you and not somebody else. You know, the one of the quotes that I really liked from the book that you included in the article um, was when Oz, uh, Oz says, how can I help being a humbug when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done? Yeah, so this is after they they catch him, I guess. And you know, I see that as hum, humbug could perhaps be a you know a synonym or, or a stand-in for corruption, right? Like how can I how can I help but being corrupt when all these people keep asking me to do things that everyone knows can't be done? So whether back to the initial part of our conversation, whether it's the church and its authority and the power that ascribes, or whether it's the the state and their authority and the power granted or vested in them as a result of that, like how the, the people at the behind the scenes at the apex and control of those, those institutions, it's almost like, how can I not, 
how can I help but becoming corrupt when all of you treating me as an authority are asking me to do things that we we would all individually identify can't be done. And th that is such a, there's so many examples of that in our world today, right? When you, you, you look at all the problems of the world and so many people that are still bought into this, you know, uh, nanny state fixes everything sort of mentality, you know, they, they ask these people with all this power, Hey, fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that. And of course those people like, and, and when you, when you ask someone to do something like that, you're saying basically control me, right? Like I, I, I'm giving my power up to you to fix it. And the, the humbug comment is kind of saying like, how can I not be corrupt when you're giving me so much of your power and asking me to do something that's impossible? Of course, I'm going to take advantage of that. Of course, I'm going to use it towards my own ends because what you're asking is not possible, but you're giving me all the power to do it anyways. Well, basically, it's also saying you should take personal responsibility for your your sovereignty, right? So basically, you have abdicated your sovereignty and you're letting somebody else do it. You've given it away. So you could also look at it as a person, personal responsibility thing, like don't give away your power because... You're well, that's a, that's creating the people like this. Comment. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's an interesting point, right? So, like, I think this whole story is pointing to the fact: be responsible. Yeah, well, I mean, take your own you, responsibility, as you point out in the article, like, and as the kind of uh, let's say mythological component of the story is that one of the big takeaways from the story is is these people start off thinking that they're deficient, thinking that they can't do something themselves, think, think, thinking that they, they don't have the, in, the, the, the capacity to achieve the ends or, or um, get what they're seeking, be it a heart, a brain, a, a ride home, what ha whatever, and ultimately finding out that through the arduous journey that, they're, that they go through, that those qualities were all inherent in them already. They just weren't they didn't they didn't believe they were there and circumstances didn't cause them to rise to the occasion to recognize them or 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 recognize that they were already there and that they they could avail of them and so uh, you know i agree that that you could very easily construe that story in terms of and and again like this is what i meant earlier when i said that you know or and what you said and what peterson often says that like stories are not only true, but they can be meta true. And this is again the the this kind of archetypal hero's journey sort of story being played out in a different, you know, in a different way. And and I think you're right, is that one of the takeaways that is you know, perhaps being communicated or, or attempting to be communicated or instilled through the story is that nobody's coming to save you. You know, stop looking outside for the solutions to your problems. Stop delegating your power to other people bring it back to the self you know seek within you for uh for the answers to your problems take that responsibility recognize that you have the capacity and the power and the authority inborn already and and do what's necessary to refine them or to bring them out or to actualize them within um to embody them let's say and actualize them within your your behavior um, and you will accrue the benefits of doing so. And as a result of doing that, also you realize kind of the the falsity of the authority that you previously were uh, hoping would help you. You're realizing that it was a mirage, that it was a false promise, that there actually isn't any there that could deliver to you. And there's nothing there that could deliver to you what it was you were seeking. Only you can deliver that to yourself. Correct. And, and I guess also what, the, the story is saying, or maybe question, the gift's question is, is that enabled through sound money adoption? Does it start, right. does that journey start with that? Because basically when you abdicate your money and, and you're believing the authority to say, no, this is money, accept the fiat, accept the legal tender, wear these green glasses. Like I decide what is your value system? Mm -hmm. And basically by not accepting that or uh, from that epoch, uh, adopting gold and silver as your money, you're also basically saying, no, I'm not accepting what is the authority saying is my value system or is my money and this is the way I want to 
store this value. And I'm mostly intrigued is like, is, is the journey set off from that point? Does it start with some money adoption? Does that, does that start the journey? of becoming in the individual is that is that the base of it well she does start off following the yellow brick road right and to our to the point we exactly. made earlier about um if you want to orient yourself most properly in the world in relation to your ambitions or or your wants and needs the the best method by which to do that is to ensure that you're interacting with the the world as it is as much as possible, i.e. the signals that you're both getting or interpreting from the world are as true as possible. And so if you're following the yellow brick road, if you're following, um, if you're operating in a world whose price signals, which are signals conveying a variety of information about basically everything, if they are as pristine or as truthful as possible by virtue of being uh, communicated in the instrument of of gold then you're you're in the best position to succeed in that endeavor and you know we could just be interpreting this like a bunch of crazy bitcoiners <laughs> morons you know, mo monetary <laughs> narrative where it is not but one it seems very apt and two to to your question i mean very this goes uh, we, we talked about your own transformation and the the kind of phenomenon of transformation once people come into Bitcoin and go down the rabbit hole and start uh, understanding all this. To answer your question, it would, it would seem very much to be the case that um, replacing the, the monetary lens that you see the world through is the beginning of the journey. And so once you swap out the green lens for the orange lens and you start to see the world more clearly and you start to see value more clearly and you start to be able to engage in the value that you are in term in order to create value in the world and move closer to the types of value that you seek, i.e. your ambitions, your goals, your needs. Um, that is the start and that is the best, best method by, by which to do that. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it, per, you know, this is the, the, the Bitcoin journey proves, proves the points. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it, this is the meeting of the mythos and the logos, right? It's like the, the technological, and I, I've used those terms somewhat differently in previous podcasts, but just in the, in, in the way that uh, you use them here in this discussion, the kind of, if you want to call the adopting Bitcoin, the, the technical aspect of this, the kind of the, the logos aspect, allowing you to kick off the journey of the mythos of the the hero's journey the internal transformation that takes place once you've adopted the correct way of seeing things let's say and then and then a, a fantastic journey awaits once you start on that road correct and um yeah i mean the the similarities are just too striking to say this was not uh the 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 point of the, the story it's it's 100 a mythological monetary fairy tale i said i i was at the bitcoin uh, amsterdam uh conference and i i was lucky enough to like speak to jeff Boo for about uh, two minutes and uh, i actually told him uh, about this story and the the project i have and uh, his first response was like uh so as I mentioned the Wizard of Oz, and he said like, "Oh yeah, that story is about the gold standard." That was his first <laughs> response, and I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, this is this is a known fact, I guess. One, if you're on the if you're a Bitcoiner and you read this story, you'll you'll make the same conclusions. It's hard not to see that this is part of the meaning. So." I think we're not not far off from the from a <laughs> correct interpretation here. <laughs> Have you ever done the thing with the movie where you sync it up with the dark side of the moon and watch the the movie? No. I th nope. I I think so this has been like a, a like a weird cult classic thing for ages but on the I think it's on the third lion's roar cuz an MGM lion before the at the beginning of the movie. Um, on the third roar of the MGM Lion, you start playing, I think it's Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd uh, album. 
And if you do that and watch the movie on silent, so the volume of the movie is, is turned down, there's so many times where the music and the movie sync up just unca in uncanny ways. Like not ju it's not just the like the vibe of the song matches the scene of the movie. It's like, you know, the toots from Tin Man's thing and the skips of Dorothy and the steps that the, you know, whatever character takes. Like it it's it's really kind of spooky. Now, caveat, I watched it when I was like 21 and high as balls. So my memory <laughs> might be somewhat uh foggy and I I might have interpreted more than was there. So I should probably go back and do it again. But I only bring it up because it's kind of just another kind of weird, spooky thing that's happening with that story or that movie um, with something else. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to ask you about? Yeah. That? Otherwise, there, there's like a one more thing I would like to highlight from the sure. uh, from the story. So afterwards, after a scarecrow takes over Emerald City, the the story continues. So so again, we we now made the reference to the. To the movie but i really recommend reading the book because it's mm -hmm. it's it's different um so what happens next after the inflationists is is gone they are um dorothy and the gang end up in uh it's called dainty china country which from my point of view was a, a form of clown world let's say so basically it's depicted as a, a big porcelain walled off city where porcelain little creatures live that basically cannot handle any form of criticism and and they're fragile and they break quickly and everybody is like no no don't don't say this and oh that's dangerous and uh, you cannot say that and uh, oh like uh, just make sure nobody gets hurt and within that enclosure, there's a, a, a joker, like a trickster archetype, uh, let's say. And he's a porcelain figure who has, uh, who has broken himself many times because he's, he's ready to say anything. He's saying the truth, uh, whatever. So he's like the broken figure and he's being glued up uh, um, back again. And I thought that was also like, so apt so like after removing the inflationist maybe like uh, your vision is clearing up and you, you see yourself moving through dainty china uh, country or, or uh, uh, clown worlds uh, let's say and i thought it was quite interesting also that the the joker or the trickster arch archetype was in that space because i i remember you you um, introduced this on uh, Bitcoin Miami 21, I think, uh, what's his name? JP Sears. You made this like oh, yeah. short introduction on him that uh, the Joker is like a repressed kind of uh, figure these days, right? And and I, I guess also that came out into this part of the, uh, the story as well, where like, I guess the integrated individual is able to receive criticism to discuss, to argue, and basically the people who aren't individuals, they can't, and they need to be, they need to, they become fragile because of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they cannot engage anymore into uh, discussion and everything needs to be protected somehow. And I thought that was like such a curious thing that was in the book. So like, I also started asking myself the question, like maybe the whole clown world experience also isn't a thing of our time and has existed also in the past and, and maybe we're just revisiting like a, a part of history again and this is actually like a normal normal thing and, and this is also how i started out that article where i quoted uh, andre guide who said that everything has been said before we just like forgot it so we have to like uh tell it again and and i guess this also really works with this whole theory on the 80 year cycle so that like the you know, your your grandmother or septite in this generation is that who still possessed that part of the knowledge who already underwent all these things and who had seen it before but they're dead now and th this knowledge is gone and basically you can only find it back from reading the, the story of a dead guy basically which is the wizard of Oz. like it's an old story 
from another period of time, but somehow somewhat uh, similar. So well, I, I thought well, that was the, the Dainty China thing was like a interesting well, find. Also, wasn't another uh, place they passed through after all everything happens was the Hammerhead uh, area. Correct town. Correct. Yeah. So you can say a few things about that. That was a bit more vague uh, to me, but so then part of the journey is also that you're, you're I guess, becoming confronted with like flat headed people who just la launch at you mm. and it's, it's an uphill, up, uphill road. So I don't know what kind of like metaphor you can draw from that, perhaps say like once you are an individual perhaps, or you have found some integrity, maybe you like start experiencing like people like launching at you perhaps, or like mm -hmm. you can um, experience friction in your life where people like with other points of view start to like, uh, no, like don't do that. And basically the story, what happens in the story is that they actually like fly over it. So they're like, okay, we're choosing now to not engage with these people because basically they're just like slowing us down right. at this point and they're flat headed figures. So they haven't like fought it out perhaps. So like, let's just avoid that whole oh, sorry, thing that, in so a way. It, was, it wasn't hammerhead. It was flat headed, right? S yeah. From what I can recall, it, it's been some time I, I, I read. But the, I, to me, read they're, they're both perfectly apt, you know? So one, I, I agree that, we we re we repeat all this stuff and this is i guess partially the role of story and myth is to try to convey wisdom that hap that just recurs and maybe that if it's conveyed in a powerful way you can one identify it when it recurs or if it's always at play and as a result of identifying maybe you can improve how you contend with with the dynamic um but, you know, when I hear that they pass through Fragile Town and Flathead Town, like the one, as you said, like, sure, everyone in safe space maximalism today, right? Like everyone's so fragile, you can't say anything about anyone without someone being offended. So there's that type of person today. But also the other type of person today is just people that, you know, reject everything, you know, just as you said, kind of just so set in, in their ways of the existing paradigm, their existing way of thinking that they don't let any new information through and it's everything. It's you're wrong. It's inflammatory. You're always going to get into a fight with these people. If And, and as you said, it seems like that's why in the story they elevate above them. They're like, there's, there's nothing of, you know, we can't, there's nothing of value to be had really. So we're just going to rise up, rise above this area and get past it on our way to what we know is more valuable or, or, you know, more beneficial. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, characterization of the dynamic today. Yeah. That, that's how I interpret it. And, and, and coming back to dainty China country, like we can venture off, like make a small detour into North mythology. So like if you look across different kinds of mythologies, you find the same stories back also, which is also like a telling, uh, I guess. So the Nor uh, in Norse mythology, they have um, there's a story with Loki, who is the the trickster, uh, the Norse trickster god, and there's a little story where uh, Freya, one of the gods, wants to guarantee that one of the other gods is like almighty and he's like invulnerable. And he's he's the strong, and the way she's she's doing that is by going through nature and asking all the living things like, uh, "Will you not harm him? Will you like? Is he invincible? Won't you? Is he unattackable? Is he invulnerable?" So she goes to all the the plants and all the creatures and asks all of them like, "Can you guarantee that you won't do him any harm and that he's really?" invulnerable and all the creatures say yes we guarantee we're gonna do this uh, but she forgets to ask one plant which is the mistletoe and then um later on somewhere in asgard where all the gods are together they have a party and they're gonna test this god out like are you vulnerable so they they throw spears at him they launch at him with with swords and then Loki is also sitting there and he figured out that Freya forgot to ask the mistletoe whether uh, 
the mistletoe was also guaranteeing his invulnerability. So she forgot that. And what Loki does is he makes a dart out of the the mistletoe and then gives it to uh, uh, the blind brother of this invulnerable god and say like, hey, you throw that at him and he kills him and he dies. And I thought that was also like so uh, telling of our times when we also see uh, also with what we experience with the whole lockdown situation and pandemic, like everything needs to bear, be guaranteed somehow. All risk needs to be taken off. Like nobody can die anymore. You you cannot take uh, a personal risk anymore. And I guess what Loki is saying, like to hell with that. Like that's not how we are s- supposed to live. Like by guaranteeing that you actually make us fragile. Yeah. And you got you're gonna die. And Loki is sort of like more portraying the the disorder or the chaos elements uh, uh, in the story. And it says like nature is gonna come for that. You cannot guarantee this. Yeah. So that, it, that reminded me again of the China country as well. It's a similar def- story. Definitely. I think it's also a, a great example of focusing too narrowly on either a threat or your development or just too narrowly in general. And so like in this case, you know, too narrowly on just consulting every little thing that could kill you and getting, making sure that they couldn't kill you. Or uh, in the case of, uh, let's say the pandemic focusing, because when you said, you know, nobody can die and everyone has to be safe anymore. It's like, I think that's informing the narrow view, but it, it's not even achieving its ends. And that's the case in the, in the myth, myth story as well, because sure, everyone was locked in their houses and all the other things that happened as a result to try to save people, quote unquote, from the virus. But how much damage was done as a result of that narrow view on trying to achieve that end? How many people didn't get diagnosis? How many people were pushed into poverty? And how many deaths does that add to the, the total? And of course, how many people are going to die as a result of the treatments that have that have been introduced for all this stuff? And so like having an overly narrow focus on trying to achieve something in a dynamic environment, I think the 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 lesson there is almost that is that is you know fraught with danger or, or that's um that's a nonsensical or it's a it's a suboptimal approach to trying to resolve or or address certain quote unquote problems or certain ends. And you and and you brought up, you know, Jeff Booth earlier. He always makes this case, but one of the things that the fiat you know, the, the fiat system does in governments in, in, in conjunction or collusion with them is say, you know, 2% GDP, right? That's, that's what we're focusing on. That's what growth means. That's what quality of life means. Okay. Well, if, if everything is tech, if technology is creating a deflationary environment where things are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and that's having a negative impact on how you calculate GDP and GDP as a political calculation in the first place, anyways, and then you say, okay, well, in order to counterbalance that, we're going to need to print more money to try to, you know, cook the books effectively. And the less that that works as a result of the accelerating deflation, well, we're actually going to have to not just change the monetary side, but we're going to have to be more author- authoritarian in trying to to cajole the demand in a way that helps us achieve our end on that narrow metric. And so you do those two things together. And what do you do? You create a hell, basically. You Not only do you exacerbate and, and accelerate the inequality uh, that, that uh, occurs as a result of siphoning people's wealth away in order to try to achieve that end, but you're, you have to engage in authoritarian measures to try to further control things as they get more and more out of control. And what you do instead of you know, even if you were well intended in the first place by focusing on this metric, thinking, well, GDP growth of two percent means you know people's lives get two percent richer, better every year, you end up destroying everybody's lives. You do the exact opposite of what you set out to do, assuming you know an honest actor here. Um, and that I think that lesson is uh, elucidated in these stories that that where a similar things happens when you focus on such when you focus on a narrow threat or a narrow approach to a threat at the expense of seeing the, the big picture, it ends up being disastrous in the end. Correct. And, and I think what's happening is that the policy is designed to, uh, quote unquote, reduce the pain 
or like um, move away from pain. So the entities in the economy that should receive the pain are currently not receiving the pain. So this is, again, with this Norse story, right? Freya was trying to prevent somebody from having pain. And basically, the whole story ended in the fact that in the end, pain came back. Nature uh, came back. And I think that the premise currently of our society based on the fiat monetary system is that we're going to take, they're constantly saying, we're actually going to take away the pain. So if there's like a, a, a problem, some bank crashed, or we have like a housing crash or whatever, you know, we're going to sedate. We're going to, the pain cannot be felt at the places where it should be felt because mm -hmm. this would be uh, a healthy economy, right? If you look at it from a biological perspective, if you have like a cancerous bit or like cells in your body, like your immune system will have to like take that out, you know, that needs to like be removed. Like that pain needs to be where it should be. It shouldn't be replaced. If you if you keep these cells alive, then it becomes a cancer, right? So uh, with, with the economy, if you take away the pain away from the entities that, that should receive the pain, you're basically postponing the pain and you're bringing pain to the people who don't deserve it through inflation. Mm -hmm. And this is a big problem. And this is the the confusing thing perhaps that's currently happening in society is that the, the pain is is not where it should be yeah well you end up you, you you're effectively doing exactly the opposite you're optimizing for the exact opposite outcome of what you think you're optimizing for and this is why you get upside down world this is why you get clown world and actually there's a i'm going to read um a short passage from uh, the article because i think this uh this sums it up nicely. It says, the knowledge of the wizard being a fraud and the journey on the path to self-sovereignty changes one's perception of the world. The journey has made the scarecrow, tin woodman, and, and lion more confident as, and strong. Ergo, the world reveals itself now to be a brittle, fearful, and single-minded place, a clown world. Which, you know, that's basically what we've just been discussing. Yeah, correct. And, and what you see in the story eventually is that uh, these entities, so how the, the story is ending, is um, basically Dorothy figures out she had the power all along to wish herself back home. So everything was already innate. She already had everything she was looking for. She had her own sovereignty. She had her own awareness, courage, sensitivity. But basically, the journey was necessary. The confrontation with the Wizard of Oz was necessary to figure this all out. And what you see happening in the story is that, in the end, all these entities have found their place. So Scarecrow is taking over Emerald City. The Tim Whitman find his finds his place. And the Lion is is taking over uh, some place of a specific force that needed a leader. So, the, so they all find their rightful place let's say it's, it's almost like a lion king uh mm -hmm. motif like they, they all come back to where they where they should be so the fake authority is removed and they all find their particular spot and dorothy herself figures out she already had all the power in herself to be where she should be and that like she already had a had an individuality but the journey was necessary yeah absolutely it's almost like when you have that perspective where the external authority is, you know, you delegate so much responsibility to it, again, back to this kind of uh, psychological tension comment, like it's almost like you must ascribe to it more stability and strength than is really there in order to pacify yourself and in, in order to justify that decision to say like, well, I wouldn't give all of my authority up to like a frail, weak, fragile system. So I must have done that in relation to a strong system. And then as the passage that I just read out suggests, and as I'm sure every Bitcoiner can attest, once you kind of, once that transformation starts happening and you're taking back responsibility for your financial sovereignty and your sovereignty in many other areas. And so it starts 
the direction starts to reverse. And so you're taking back authority and responsibility from the places that you previously delegated. Then you look out on the world and you're like, oh my God, it's like super fragile, you know, to use the term from the book. It's game, a mess. Fr fragile. Yeah, it's an absolute dumpster fire. And you're like, oh my God, you know, how come I didn't see this before? And and it's it's just fat. And, be, and I think part of the reason is because now that you've changed your approach, now that you've, you know, um, oriented yourself from the sovereignty and authority primarily within you and taken responsibility for all those things, diminishing the importance of the external authority system. And as a result, diminishing that per perhaps psychological, you know, sleight of hand that you might have done to justify that. Once all that is dialed down, then you can see things more clearly and you you see them for what they are. And you're like, oh my, you know, as we said, you see how fragile they are. And, uh, you know, I think this is why we have such a kind of hilarious time on on Twitter poking fun of it all the time because you see like a problem will pop up somewhere in the world and the response is print a billion dollars that'll fix it you know or you know some absurd approach to fixing to patching a problem to putting a band-aid over one of the you know million problems that this system is at an increasing pace revealing of itself and uh you know I guess Bitcoiners are, are are some of the first cohort that is starting to change how they see that, you know, starting to unplug from the matrix, starting to, to reveal, um, you pull back the curtain on the wizard, as it were, and, you know, more every day. Yeah, and, and how amazing it is that this has already been described in a book from 1900, mm. right? So coming back again to this whole 80 years cycle thing, the word story me, it comes from storehouse. So basically you could look at it as like the, the story is some kind of like place where we lock up stuff that we tend to forget. Mm. And we forget things, let's say over a period of 80 times. I mean, it was mentioned on your last show, your macro hang where Jeff Booth said again, like he asked the question, like why does this happen again and again and again every 80 years? But it's also interesting because that means like we can go back in time, read the story from that age, and here are the answers. Humanity has already in, in some kind of way already passed through this, these stages and like needs to learn again and again and again. And hopefully now with Bitcoin, we don't have to like unlearn it again. Mm -hmm. We can break away from that repetitive cycle where we each time forget what has happened and have something more strong in place now that won't be disrupted so yeah i mean i, f I just find it fascinating this is this is this is all documented already and, and again we might be like total buffoons here completely <laughs> like over interpreting this story but I recommend to every Bitcoiner, this should be part of your bibliography. Read it. Read the book. It's it's a small book. It's 100 pages, perhaps. You, you, you can have it done in one or two days. And it's so informative with all its symbolism. It's it's just amazing. Well, I haven't read it, but I, I can't wait to after having read your article on it. Where did you say you could get it for free? Yeah, gutenberg.org. Gutenberg. Um, org. Yeah, so yeah. this is a, this is a website for um, uh, basically books that that like the the copyright is like or the authorship Inspired. is gone. Like after eight, yeah, after eight years, yeah. You know, perhaps it's the case with stories. You know, I I think they serve the role that you just referred to, and I wonder how often it's intentional that writers do it that way, because if we go back to that question of like you know, the masses versus the Carl Jung uh, characterized them in a, in a particular way, which I liked, and I included in a piece of writing I once did. But it was something to the effect of, um, you know, the the most refined or uh, differentiated minds of the age are the first to to see the new paradigm, or something like that. And and of course, he also goes on to say about how much they're ridiculed in the because they are a minority seeing things differently and acting differently in the beginning, and then they become if the if the ideas are true or an improvement of the former paradigm 
then that becomes the majority and then the process plays out again. Um, but I wonder, because like, when was it the case? Do we have any examples when that wasn't the case? I mean, like, look at Socrates, right? Like he gets, uh, he gets put on trial and, and executed for quote unquote, corrupting the youth of Athens. Like when did we, was there ever a period where we just had an enlightened society or was it always, I mean, would you even identify people as being special as we do, as we look back at history, if it were not for how they were differentiated from everybody else? Would we like, will we look at Plato as being special? If everyone else was thinking and, and writing like Plato, would we look at Shakespeare as being special? You know, so it's like, it's almost like that's the definition of being notable or being special. You have to be out from the crowd. And my question regarding like story is when it's things that are perhaps sensitive or when people are afraid of saying something explicitly or, or overtly, but they want to say it and they think it's an important message to propagate even if it's somewhat subconscious do they put place it in story right like and and again i have no knowledge or evidence at all for this but like if bomb was like a a hard money enthusiast right and he saw the dangers of of the central banking system and all that kind of stuff maybe it was a super sensitive issue back in the day and and i know he was into theater and stuff like that so a combination of interests but all all to say like what if he was a huge critic of central banking and he just didn't want to be involved in the political mess and he didn't want to be canceled and he didn't want to lose his theater contracts and all that kind of stuff so he didn't say it explicitly but he put it in a narrative format that would go underneath the surface that wouldn't attract too much attention but people with an eye to see might notice it might see his wink throughout the ages and and you know establish a connection with him in that way and maybe even be have their perspective upgraded or informed by by the way he articulated that narrative and maybe that's how he decided to express his discontent and contribute to you know a change of some kind yeah or, or you're saying like or uh, wasn't he fully aware and did he imagine it did he did he just write up a story from his unconscious which came up to be that and like, like he had a feeling for it but he wasn't totally sure what he was doing are you saying that no i'm i'm saying the more explicit intentional one but maybe that one's even more likely who, who well perhaps, perhaps it's who a bit of both like I, like if i read that story as a bitcoiner i see intent because that's, it's yeah, just that, yeah, it works what i'm saying it works in too many ways so like i i'm so the conclusion is maybe this was the surreptitious way of getting this story out to children or maybe like to program them in a surreptitious <laughs> uh, way so that hopefully when they they become adults they they would know you know or they would come back to the story and read it again and say like hey wait a minute uh what was this guy saying actually uh but i I'm not too sure about it. Like th for sure there's intense. Um, I mean, we could also look at the matrix where it's like, um, because people have said with that one too, like this is a money story. They're like, yeah, th this is about a system sucking away your energy and, and the money metaphor is completely visible to me. And, and I don't have information on that. That could, could be true, but I would also say, maybe they just had a good feeling for what was happening and they they were really in tune with the things at play and they weren't fully aware of it so like i, I think there's definitely a case to make uh for that point of view um on it as well and it it, it happens from time to time what i also like there there are fascinating stories where for example scientists uh, come to like their hypothesis through dreams sometimes. So there's a famous case of um, a chemist that was trying to figure out what was the, um, uh, the molecular structure of benzene. And he, he had no clue. He, he, he tested and he was like, I, I, I can't figure it out. Until one night he had a dream of the Ouroboros of the snake eating his tail. So like he got like a mythological kind of dream that night. And the next morning he woke up and he was like, it's a circular structure. <laughs> and that became his hypothesis. 
and 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 he tested that and that turned out to be true so i guess that is an example i guess of people imagining the the future or perhaps how reality works without consciously fully knowing it another example perhaps the sovereign individual thesis was partially constructed on science fiction so uh, the guys read for example neuromancer by william gibson who's famous for saying the future is already here it's just distributed unequally or something mm -hmm. and uh, neil stevenson's uh, snow crash which is about a uh, future uh, city states kind of dystopia where the uh, american dollar has uh, hyperinflated and society has collapsed and they 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 they, they use that as part of their argumentation and they they read those stories to inform themselves of what was going to happen later so i guess in a way authors or imagination could in fact help informing things we are like sort of unaware of but coming back to the wizard of oz i'd say it's mostly intense intentional. partially imagining yeah mostly intentional a little wink across time to other hard money peeps but you know i I, I agree. And this is really interesting, right? Because what is the relationship between our thoughts and our physical bodies and how all of, or how both of them and everything else came to be, right? Like, why wouldn't we expect that there's a, a link of some kind between how our, our thoughts are constructed and how uh, our bodies work? Now, not to say you can just think and access, you know, the structure of DNA. And I don't know if the, the Crick and Watson story is actually true. You know, who knows? But of course, they make that claim that it was perceived in an altered state, the structure of DNA. But just the point, like, why would the default assumption be that there that whatever process brought, you know, coalesced, you know, uh, molecules and minerals and all the stuff together to form our physical bodies and all the different structures of our brain? would not influence thought in some way. I mean, surely it would have to. And so why would there not be a way of, you know, almost like a, an imprint of the same uh, structure or organization, or at least a, a, you know, a fractal representation of one and the other, or, or that type of relationship between the two, you know? And so I know it's kind of, far out, but I, I don't know why the default assumption is that we would expect there to be a completely no link and, you know, the the form or function of one would not have any relation to the other because they're so intimately connected. And I, I think this is partially why, you know, we have this, we have the saying, right? A tale as old as time story, story, stories are structured in the way they are, you, you know, they can tell different messages but they're structured in the way they are because that resonates somehow with the structure of how we think and our thought. And if we go to the the example of Ma of the Matrix, you know, I, I find it incredible how apt the metaphors are for our current situation today. And and prior to Bitcoin, I thought it for a commentary on on society and culture and and people that were awake and sleep and the the theme we've talking about about the mass and the people that were awakening and stuff. And of course, once you add the Bitcoin layer onto it, it becomes even more rich. But look at Plato's cave story, you know, like very similar thing, right? People are in the cave, don't know what the hell's going on. They think it's all real. It's just shadows on the wall. It's not actually real. Then, you know, once you crawl out blinding light, you know, you know, cause you're, you've, why, why do my eyes hurt? You've never used them before. Like it's the exact same things that happen. And then what happens, you go back down in the cave to try to communicate the truth to the people that are still stuck in the illusion. You know, and and so it's almost like these stories, the structure is very similar. The the details and the setting changes to make it salient to people in a certain time, right? So the Matrix story uses computer science and, and software and machines and that kind of stuff because that's the environment we live in. And so that makes it more salient. It makes it more realistic, more so than if people were in loincloths and, you know, coming out of a cave and that kind of thing, because we can't relate as much to that. And so there, there's, I think that's part of the reason why stories take such a, a, a similar shape. And even 
you could make a case that there's almost a hierarchy of the validity of certain what those stories communicate. And, you know, Peterson talks about this a lot in terms of the religious narrative. Like you have stories that maybe communicate things that are of minor importance, but still almost universal in a sense. And then you have the ones at the top of the hierarchy that are of paramount importance and also universal. And it's those stories that kind of most influence all other stories that that follow from them. And yeah, I think uh, I think there's a lot of validity to that way of you know perceiving this the phenomenon that is story in our culture and in relation to human consciousness. Yeah, I fully agree, and I think we could look at uh, language and and stories perhaps as because you men mentioned DNA as like a, a second layer uh, DNA sort of sort of speak mm. like a virtual virtual uh, genetics basically because nature first only could figure out itself through survival of genes basically until the brain was developed and from that point on people were able to communicate let's say the brain is the basically the invention of biological software so uh, from that point on, you can learn things without undergoing uh, natural selection, per se, right? So by adopting a good idea, you can better coordinate with the environment without needing to die. So in a way, the brain has um, uh, introduced, let's say, genetic, a uh, horizontal genetic transfer. So like b bacteria can like shoot some like genetics to like anyone humans can do that like our genetics are vertical we only pass it through our uh, offspring uh, but through ideas basically you can adapt to the uh, environments through stories right. so this is dawkins meme versus gene sort of idea right exactly yeah yeah this is selfish uh, gene uh, uh, stuff so and and combining that i guess with uh, Jungian psychology, um, perhaps like the, the primitive brain or primitive language was not perhaps uh, language based, but it was more like uh, symbolism based, it was working through images, uh, perhaps, right? So like, why do kids like fairy tales? Because it's using archetypes, it's using images that are already imprinted on our, let's say, primary language. Well, humans, not even, not even in our life. brain. I think it's, yeah, I totally agree. But I, I just want to interrupt for one second to say, I think it's not, not even that they like them. Why do stories even, like, why do they even make sense to children's brains or to any of our brains? Because whether we like one or not, I agree with you, like, if, children are very receptive to stories as we all are but i think they even like the the crazier thing to assume is why do stories even cohere with the way our our awareness or our consciousness functions yes and and to bring in the the bible story of or religion or, or uh, look at the plethora of stories out there they've undergone massive uh uh natural selection or selective pressure because we have to realize that all the stories out there are the stories that survived. Mm -hmm. And if we still uh, find meaning in, let's say, The Wizard of Oz or Norse mythology, and I guess mythology stands out because it has been capable to survive over centuries, right? So that means they're alluding to true things. They're, they're good stories. They're good storehouses, and, and we value them, and we keep reproducing them like like a sort of virus you know like a sort of mind virus like okay these these work somehow there, there's something um uh to them and i guess like mythology and religion have have like figured it out in a sense that they are programmed for uh yeah, yeah they use symbolism and they like strike a a, a deep truth uh somewhere of our existence yeah, well, I totally agree. They, they wouldn't still be with us if they didn't have a very pragmatic purpose. If using that as a software to interface with the world, if that was if that 
resulted in in poor outcomes or results. It would have been discarded a long time ago. The fact that it's been preserved and refined to certain degrees up to this point means that it's it, it's highly it's been proven to be highly beneficial in allowing one to in, interface optimally with the world. The big juicy question in my mind is we seem to be on the precipice of a very substantial change in in many of these areas both in our understanding of ourselves in the tools we use to engage the world in the fact that we now create the world ourselves in terms of digital uh environments so it's not just the natural world we're contending with now we're we're all immediately connected and now we have a pristine language for communicating value to one another what kind of upgrade to the software is that going to necessitate? And that's a huge open question for me. I think it, I'm pretty confident in the premise that it's going to necessitate a so-called software upgrade, a narrative upgrade. Uh, but who knows what, well, you know, what, I, I, and I feel Bitcoin is going to be integral and central to that. Um, but who knows how much of the former software, the former narratives, you know, the former religions and stuff we we keep and integrate because again they've been pr they did a lot of proving over you know the last five thousand years let's say, but how much of them are going to be, you know, relevant to this world that we're now moving into? So how much do we keep? How much do we discard? And and what gets added to it to, once again, be the most optimal interface for engaging in the rapid, not only the new world that we can, we're contending with, but the rapidly, the, the more accelerated pace of change in the world that we're contending with as well. And so what kind of a mental, you know, mental framework, what kind of a narrative, what kind of a story is going to be the one that allows for optimal engagement with that? And that's a, perhaps there's no more important question than that, really. Yeah. So, so are you saying like there should be a, a new story or like, are you expecting like an, a new mythology to like uh, turn up? Because like the, the I, I would say we're in a pretty weird situation because basically we, the Bitcoiners have undergone the software upgrades without, and, and Bitcoin is software. It, it's almost like it's also installed almost in your brain. It, it, it has changed us, but it, not really through through a story. So I, I don't know. My, my, my question is like, like, do you expect like a new mythology to like, well, come up or you say Bitcoin has changed you not through story, but what is your interpretation of Bitcoin absent the narrative meaning that you give to it in terms of how you understand it? Like, I, I, I get that it's, you know, just a so-called technology, but I think we, I think meaning is a product of our narrativization of things. I think that's kind of how it emerges. And so for meaning to arise, we have to have narrativized it in some way. And I think we have with Bitcoin. I mean, look, look at what, how we talk about it. We talk about it being hope for the future and a mechanism of seeing more truth in the world and a way of you know instilling more hope and transformation in people and all this kind of stuff. And that is very much narrative, in, in, in my opinion. And... So that's why I say, like, I think Bitcoin and how we're seeing it and how we're understanding it, contextualizing it, communicating it, interacting with it is going to be integral into this new, let's just say, software upgrade or interface. And because that's the language we've been using thus far in the conversation. Um, we're at, and so I think it'll be integral. But again, you know, the, the former narratives, the former stories, let's just broadly say religion and philosophy, theology, all that stuff that people have used to interface with the world, to orient themselves most truthfully, most optimally in the world. As I said, I mean, they've done a ton of proving. And I, I don't think, I doubt it's the case that now all that is irrelevant just because our, our environment and our circumstance is changing rapidly and profoundly. So I don't know like what the mix is going to be in the future. Um, I'm hesitant to say, well, I don't know. You know, it's something I think a lot about. I'm, I'm writing a lot about it right now, so I, I probably shouldn't uh, try to articulate it and do a bad job. But to me, that's the most interesting open question is like, and, it, and it's integrally tied up in like, well, what is meaning? What is value? You know, what is truth? All these massive questions. And how does this, 
new technological environment that we're contending with um, change the validity of those ideas that help us interfa interface with the world? Um, and I, I think the answer is it's going to be profound, but I, you know, I don't have, I don't have much more that I can, I can say clearly at this point. Yeah, perhaps it's interesting to what's going to happen. Perhaps on one side, maybe people will, will find satisfaction within the old religions perhaps for that, but maybe Bitcoin will like, be, like almost become it's like new religion. Maybe there's going to be a, Basically, there is already a lot of storytelling around uh, Bitcoin and, and and Satoshi and how uh, he left the, the project. And I, I'm not sure it's got the quality to become like a full-blown religion. Um, but there, there are a few things to, to, to say about it, perhaps, because I, I don't know, like the, the narrative part of Bitcoin in a way is still like vacant i would say and and what do you mean because also well in the form of uh is there really like a, a big mythology on like how to live your life uh with bitcoin integrated into that story i'm not well, sure I don't, I don't think it's explicit that's not what i mean i mean that when we interpret <clears throat> it the the meaning that we ascribe to it each individually um, fits within a narrative structure. And that's, that's kind of how we ascribe meaning and how we derive meaning from it. Not to say that there's one explicitly. So my, my, the stronger emphasis I would place on this type of argument is that, is that however each of us understand and determine the significance or value of Bitcoin, it's happening within a narrative structure from which we derive meaning. And so, that is already kind of the same sort of dynamic that happened in religions of the, of course, religions became, at least some of them became very explicit. But the secondary point I would say is, I mean, if you look at the kind of mythology that's forming around Satoshi and his, you know, extreme benevolence and that he gifted this thing to the world and then disappeared. And there's, there's kind of an explicit s story that's mythological esque that, you know, has begun has begun to propagate around the history of Bitcoin. Just you know, the the uh, the immaculate conception, as it were, and then how it survived in the darkness for a long time, and then it you know, and how it flourished. So that's less interesting to me because uh, I don't think it's as deep uh, as the former. But I do think both of those are are kind of happening, and so it'll be interesting to see how they both. Uh, develop over time yeah and and i guess it's also like really looking for lenses and and frameworks to explain this the situation uh we're in so like on on one side we have um let's say new stories like i mean the, the matrix is a, a bit old now but i i always considered the matrix or even the titanic i would say as in like the the fairy the fairy tale jumps to the screen like this is the latest mm. form of of what is myth this is modern myth basically yeah. um and yeah we're like scavenging for like good stories to like explain it so wizard of oz was one way the matrix is, is another framework um but you know uh we go ahead i was just you know a minute ago you said um you know, you the kind of questioning the religious religiosity of Bitcoin, let's say. And I, I think, as you know, I mean, going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole is such an intellectually stimulating pursuit, right? Because it kind of everything is on the table to be reconsidered. And that's wonderful for anyone who enjoys that sort of thing or anyone who's on a, a genuine quest for truth, I would say. Um, but it also brings up the question. So your question was like, well, is Bitcoin really kind of like religious in that sense? What came to my mind was, what is even religious? What are we talking about when we use that term, when we talk about, you know, people treating something as religion? So my, you know, my take is that talk is cheap, basically. What do people act, what do people's actions reveal? And so you can, you know, you can say, you can espouse the tenets of any particular faith. 
but I want to know what is the primary motive for action in your life? What is the pr primary motivator of your behavior? And when I look at Bitcoiners and see how much time they spend thinking about and trying to understand Bitcoin and the different ways in which it's going to impact their lives in the broader world and their, how it influences their plans for the future, how it fosters the transformations that we alluded to earlier, how they want to congregate and meet with other people who are also Bitcoiners, i.e. seeing things in a similar way, how they want to share the knowledge with other people that don't see it yet because they realize the benefit that it can bring to their lives how they devote their time to working towards it, either working in a Bitcoin company, working for sats, et cetera. I mean, all of those things and more scream to me, that is true devotion almost. You know what I mean? Because it's showing up in action. I mean, it's not even, I'm not even trying to promote that. I'm just observing and saying, what is a religious belief other than the degree to which a certain belief shows up in action because anyone can say anything they want. Who cares? Talk, you know, again, talk is cheap, but how do the principles that you are most oriented by that are, you know, the values that are at the at top of your hierarchy of behavior, how are they being directed in your life? How are they showing up in the world? And for what reason, what's pulling them out? And as I look around the Bitcoin space, I see nothing but examples of this thing being the prime motivator in people's lives or one of the prime motivators in people's lives and being tremendously influential and, tra and, and transformational, even far more than what people would, might explicitly say is their belief system and the things that they value most. Because you just have to watch the action. You say, how devoted are you to the, this one and how devoted are you to this one? How much time are you willing to sacrifice for this one and that one? How much enthusiasm and energy do you do do you derive from being involved in this one or that one and again like we could go down the list of all those different things that you know you and i and many other people in this space are doing and religion has been such a tainted word that you know it, it's difficult to have a conversation with it but what like i think it should be defined as or maybe you know maybe we find another way to characterize it but again what is it but just simply identifying the thing that's the, the the greatest motivator of your action or the 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 thing that's that inspires you the most toward your highest potential something like that you know the thing that the interface that allows you to maximize your maximize the good in your life and in the broader world i mean are those not all kind of decent descriptors of what a religious belief is supposed to be and if if they are then to your point like you said well will bitcoin become religion kind of already is if if you describe it in those terms so that's why i i say like it's it's the most juicy question for me because i think there's a lot more at play here that than initially meets the eye yeah yeah it's it's we're trying to figure it out <laughs> i guess yeah, and, stumbling um, around in the dark uh, yeah and and again i'm gonna repeat myself but I, I guess the the story framework or mythos is perhaps the the best tool um what we what we have here and yeah what is happening when you adapt the bitcoin standard is just so crazy it's like shifts your whole world around revelatory suddenly. you and, might and, say it, yeah and <laughs> like it, it's it's like giving your you your time back right like i guess this is like sort of what's working constantly in your mind suddenly it's like hey i might be in the possibility to have more time than i really thought or like i have more freedom to do the things i actually want to do hmm. what are those things actually because i've been so caught up in the mm. fiat ponzi i didn't have the time to really think about that and maybe i've been making some compromises here and there that i mm. might to like revert and 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 this is the process i guess this is what what is 
happening and suddenly you put everything again all your choices again like hmm i need to reevaluate this again is this a good investment of my time uh, and this is what what bitcoin is doing to you yeah. i think i mean is it too much of a stretch to say you're reborn in bitcoin you know we we started this conversation off with with referring to how so many of us delineate between our fiat selves and the kind of post transformation post rabbit hole perspective that we have and as you just said i mean there's so many ways in which this this is freeing people up acting as a type of savior to say hey now you can you have more freedom at determining the validity of your action, at determining what you value more, at determining how you want to engage the world with your limited resources. And, uh, you know, it's a point that I've thought about a lot as well. It's like so many go through life and they never have that opportunity. They, they never have that degree of freedom to actually spend the time determining for themselves, like, is this what I value? Is this what I want to do? And now that I have more time, more freedom, more resources... What is most important to me, you know, but, but again, you know, and I'm, I'm being somewhat playful here because I know these are serious topics, but again, if we, if we analyze the language that you and I and many other people use it, like saying like how all these things that changed as a result of, 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 you know, learning about using um, and engaging with Bitcoin, it's kind of like a rebirth, is it not? You know, you look back on your old self, you're like, wow, I was doing things that I now think are absurd and i was thinking certain ways and i was spending my time and i engaged in behavior that i'm now somewhat ashamed of you know like you look back on it and you 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 perceive the space the distance you perceive the difference and so if you're that you know if you're that much of a different person if your perspective is that different now if we want to use narrative dramatic language in describing that we would say well yeah i've been reborn to a certain degree yeah um I think it's true. Like if I look at my change, I would also say that I was highly in need of Bitcoin because at a certain point with my experience with what happened during the, during the pandemic, like I was getting sick, like really, you know, I was not in a, in a good place. I was really like, what? What the hell is happening? You know, mm. this is not this is not uh, right. You know, and so I guess pre Bitcoiners or pre Coiners, let's say, this is a question I have. Like maybe you have an answer, but like Bitcoin almost almost requires you are getting sick of the current situation and you are actually looking for this or are in need it's like i look at bitcoin often as like a, a kind of medicine like which i was sort of looking for and and, and needed uh, to take in and and the thing um to like introduce a, a word here I, i'm i'm studying i use some of my time to like studying words I, I find it really interesting because often i find that the, the the true meaning of some words has has been lost uh, in a way. Uh, for example, we discussed mythos, how that has become falsehood instead of truth. Uh, but there's also curiosity, and curiosity sometimes is also has a negative uh, connotation. But it stems from actually curare, meaning to heal. So curiosity actually means it's like you're in you're in pursuit of of healing and so when you're sick when you're sick the the answer or, or your medicine is all is not within your domain because if it was then you would have found it and you wouldn't be sick so i guess for me from my point of view becoming a bitcoiner was first becoming really sick with the system that made me curious enough to like go beyond what I knew into like looking for the cure basically, which was, Bitcoin, which was Bitcoin. So my question is, is, is like, does one, and also coming back to the wizard of Oz and the matrix, like does one really need to get to the maximum point of nihilism or sickness perhaps to realize like, 
I need something else. This is not working for me anymore. Yeah. When when you talk about being sick, do you just mean kind of like diseases of despair? So like not only, and I don't only mean like uh, anxiety, depression, that kind of stuff, but how that influences physiology. So your immune system is suppressed and you're just, you know, like, so you're talking about that sort of dynamic of how that kind of suppresses one's health generally. Also, I guess, and and they they are like uh, symptoms of, I guess, the 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 fiat system, right? But um, I mean, the, the symptoms of the sickness in in the case that you were uh, saying, like prior to Bitcoin or early twenty 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 or whatever, like when you're saying you were sick all the time, you just mean like the you know uh, not feeling well and literal general ill health, but probably due to lack you know a certain degree of nihilism certain degree of despair a certain degree of anxiety that kind of stuff is that what you mean oh also and also uh, seeing how our governments were reacting to the COVID pandemic where i was like okay um you you are showing me now that basically i don't have sovereignty anymore and you're deciding for me now and i have different views so like th- this is oh like you, you start re- to question the sick like revolt you were revolted by it is that what you also, mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. What was I going to say? Well, I I can pick up while you're thinking about it. Um, yeah. I. So. I think I think that's very. There's many ways into this thing. I think the the degree of nihilism, despair, dissatisfaction, disagreement with everything that's going on, like that angst and that tension, can certainly cause someone to be more seeking of a solution and that just broadens their search for solutions and that means if a solution is available they're more likely to find it i I, you know anecdotally i know people that weren't so distraught that ended up finding bitcoin and going down the rabbit hole and kind of winding up in a in a similarly transformed space so i don't think it's a necessarily a necessity but I think a lot of people found it that way because necessity is the mother of all invention. And so if you're really at rock bottom, if you're really dissatisfied with things, you're just going to be more curious, as you say. And that's an interesting etymology of of curiosity. Um, and I, it makes total sense, right? And, and it's not only that, I think part of it is probably the quest, right? Having an objective and that helps to focus your, your attention and your effort, but also that the presupposition of the quest is something of value at the end of it, whether it be truth or whether it be meaning or something else. And so you being on a worthwhile journey, attempting to close the gap or or unite, let's say, with something of greater value, I think that can be tremendously invigorating. That can be tremendously, you know, um, that can you can call upon a tre- tremendous amount of strength in that sort of pursuit. And again, like I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the, I'm borrowing words from, from religious language to just kind of, uh, stir the pot and prove a, or make a case here. But, you know, as you're saying this and I, and, and I've experienced it myself. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners have to varying degrees about how your general well-being, like even absent how much wealth you have and what other things you might have, but just your mental and physical well-being uh, has been Im- improved and perhaps dramatically improved by Bitcoin. And and I don't think that would come as a surprise to anybody because when you have more hope for the future, when you're more dedicated to a cause that you find meaningful, when you're in the company of other people that you know think the same way and share values, when there's a reason to wake up in the morning, when there's a reason to you know be uh, you know you're an optimized version of yourself, whatever that might be for you like there's lots of literature in the, in this, even in the scientific and medical literature that, you know, shows that effect, you know, it's not strictly speaking the placebo effect, but it's, it's all of these quality of life factors that go into a stronger immune system that go into, you know, dialing down the inflammation that leads to, you know, depression and and other variety of other disorders. I mean, like this is all fairly well documented. And so uh, what the, the the cheeky comment I was going to make is, is it fair to say that Bitcoin is also healing the sick? You know, so again, like we, we we see a lot of these parallels when something of tremendous meaning that kind of 
uh, brings truth to perception and invigorates and creates an internal invigoration or invigorates the soul, if you want to use more dramatic language, um, there's tremendous effects. And I think when we look at mythological or religious narr narrative in the past, and we see whatever it, the specifics of the narrative were, but we see their impact characterized in a certain way. I think there's a lot of like the, the real important takeaway is the, the power. Let me see if I can get this right. Is not the specifics of the character or the circumstance, but it's, it's that things exist in the world and in our consciousness that have that type of power. And they are construed in different ways in different places in different times. And it seems to me to be the case if I just observe the language that Bitcoiners are using and stuff that they are in the presence of or have integrated an idea of such and, and something tangible perhaps also of such significant power that it's having a lot of the same effects as whatever that artifact or individual was in past stories or whatever that artifact or individual was in past stories. I got the the emphasis wrong there, but do you know what I'm trying to say? Like it's a similar thing happening just with, with a different name, a different face. Yeah. And coming back I'm not to saying the you have to agree boss, with that. I just wanted to get that. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just looking for the right metaphor and looking back again at the wizard of Oz. So basically you have like remove the, the lie or the corruption or the inflationist from the center of, of your world. And you brought in awareness now, and now everything is shining a new, in a, in a new light. And you see like, oh, like, wait a minute. Why was I doing that? And why was I dealing with this? And why did I make a choice to like invest so much of my time with that? So I, doesn't it also have, is, isn't that like a, a right metaphor? So like basically, okay, boom, the green glasses are off and orange, orange glasses on. And now it's like, Okay, this is a, a new playing field here. I have more time. Like, I have to make a lot of new choices now. The whole world is is basically uh, different, and and this is like working on you, I think. And and yeah, it's a journey. And and for example, in the Wizard of Oz, it doesn't stop after the inflation is is gone and you've put on the orange glasses, right? It's your that's halfway that's halfway the story. After that, it's you're gonna have to move through clown world. Right. And you have to like orient or orientate yourself within the clown world and in the flat headlands. Maybe make the decision to fly over it and not engage and mm -hmm. come home, perhaps. Well I don't know. I'm No, there you go. The the return is always part of the story. You mentioned the Lion King earlier. It's not just about going and starting with Hakuna Matata, I don't care, shrugging the responsibilities and then saying, no, 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 I have a responsibility to ascend to who I'm supposed to be and go back and take that responsibility and save, you know, myself, my community, right? There's that go back narrative. Similarly, in the cave allegory, right? It's not just about getting to the outside of the cave and being, you know, seeing the light and seeing the true world, it's about going back into clown world and trying to effectuate positive change there, trying to, you know, bring people with you. And as you say, in, in, in the Oz story, it's not just about everything being done once, you know, the inflationist is proved to be a fraud, but it's still moving through contending with, you know, the, the world as it is. The journey is not over yet. Once you see the truth, maybe, maybe seeing the yes. truth is the beginning of the journey and embodying the truth exactly. and acting it out is, is the long-term journey is the real rub, yeah. you know? Yeah, and it, it becomes, or or let's take uh, Star Wars for example. It's the the after he uh, Luke figures out uh, his father is Darth Vader. That's also halfway the story, and the the final part of this story is about how how did he integrate that knowledge, right? 
like how did he integrate the, the dark side or these uh, things he thought were bad, but like were actually also a uh, uh, part of him. So the next part of the journey is like, okay, now you see everything different. How am I going to integrate this? And am I seeing, am I currently aware of, of like new entities that like need reintegration actually? And am I, am I seeing things in the unconscious that need to like uh, require reintegration that I need to like think over again? Because if this is about seeing, if this is about value, then it makes sense that after this process of, or after going on the Bitcoin standard, you see also in yourself things differently or things that you have perhaps not spent time on and that require time or things in the fiat world that didn't get their um, attention. Like, like one of the interesting archetypes I always find is the, is a trickster archetype, I guess, because uh, society has been really good to repress that one, and it's also considered mostly people have a negative connotation also with the with the trickster, I guess. But basically, the for example, the jester is part of the the trickster archetype, which is all about like the the throat area, like speaking truth, saying what you what you think and this is underdeveloped in 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 most i guess and i guess also bitcoin is activating that and and showing that like oh no listen i now have like a different view and i see the world differently i also need to like vocalize it now because this is my truth and i need to like speak this thing out right mm -hmm. so these are like little little bits i think of of the story where it's like ah like i i now see that in a different light how am I going to develop that? And I'm going to put time on that to like make that work uh, within me. And, and those could be, let's say, shadow, like how you would call it, shadow bits that the society has condemned or like fiat society has condemned. Like, oh, no, no, these are like bad things and like, you know, conform, you know? Whereas like parts of, let's say, the trickster who is in the shadow is more like rule breaking, speaking up, uh, crossing boundaries, perhaps, which which can be, in a lot of cases, uh, good things. Like these these parts can also be reintegrated. So, like, yeah, I, I guess it's just shedding a new light and shows you what what kind of like psychological and spiritual work there is to be done within. Yeah. And I, as you're saying that two things come to mind, one is, is, you know, you're talking about the truth, having the capacity to reveal to you the different aspects of yourself that were perhaps, you know, false or grounded in false perception, and then you can identify them and then you can refine them. You can integrate them. Basically the truth enables you to fit more, uh, congruently, or, or, or develop a, a more congruent fit between what you want yourself to be and what the world is, right? And, and so you're, you're kind of, the truth is what allows those things to conform optimally. And by virtue of that conforming, and we even use this language in like psychology and stuff, like we think some sort of bias or some sort of misunderstanding was holding me back or some sort of aspect of my unconscious was, was uh, weighing on me or holding me back, something like that they serve as impediments to you achieving that congruence, you know, that, that fit with the world, that fit with truth and goodness, let's say. And this is why my favorite quote of all time is the truth shall set you free because that's literally, it, it seems to be that that's literally what it's, what it does. Like a truthful perception allows you to remove the impediments to your maximum actualization, let's say, whatever that might be. And absent the truth, you're not capable of doing that because there's so many things known and unknown that would be impediments that would be holding you back that would be bringing you down you know the the you're, the language correct is... and you're not even viewing you're not even view, viewing the world correctly you have right. your 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 glasses are dirty yeah exactly and, and that and that phenomenon you know shows up in so much of uh, our language and and you know, the other thing when you brought up um star wars you know just it continues to 
it's so intriguing that, you know, in all these different stories where there's a very similar structure, the question is, and like, how many movies does the bad guy win and all the good guys die? Like almost none, right? Because nobody wants to see that shit. There's something about how our consciousness works that, you know, certain structures of narratives appeal to it. Right. And there's obviously an, like an ethical dimension to that, why it appeals to us. And the question is, is like, why is it that that consciousness is structured that way? Why is it that consciousness seems to have an ethical component to it? You know, and this will get, you know, perhaps the, the hardcore atheists, you know, all in a twist because, you know, they might uh, push back on you know, the notion of right and wrong or good and evil or, or you know, I shouldn't, you know, I don't want to broad, too broadly characterize them, but just to say, like, it, it's a very underappreciated fact. And again, you know, I'm, my thinking on this is highly influenced by Peterson, and he talks about this a lot. But there's a reason why the stories maintain a similar structure over time, and the kind of veneer just changes, because stories that don't kind of conform to a certain structure are not coherent to us. And, and I think, and there's a the reason why they're not coherent is because they don't make us feel a certain way. We don't we don't think they're good stories, and both good in the sense of like, you know, uh, like I liked that thing, but also good as in terms of good and bad. You know, there's a it seems to be that they're cohering with something that's not only well, that's I, I don't know how to say it, but that has an ethical dimension, and it's just it's an extremely fascinating to to try to dig into why that might be and what's going on there. And, and, you know, again, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the pursuit of truth. You know, you, you want to try to understand how you think, how you act, you want to know thyself so that you can engage in the world, engage with the world and with on, on more truthful terms, let's say. And the presupposition there or the faith is that that will set you free. And I think I have that faith. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in the end, it's uh, all about uh, rescuing your father from the belly of the whale, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is Star Wars. Yeah, and you Basically. Know, what, what what does the archetype of the father represent? The old order, the old paradigm, yeah. the form of stability that's become stultified and tyrannical and... <laughs> Here we are, you know. What's this is a bit the danger of, of like uh, of like discussing these things because like they we're on the edge of like the mystique of what it is to be human and and, right. and right. what is important and and somehow stories have figured it out because again looking at it from an evolutionary perspective they have survived mm -hmm. so they are telling us something otherwise they would have been gone so yeah, uh, yeah I, I i guess um those stories are about finding lost pieces of our selves and how to sort of find them back and bring them back into uh consciousness or being at least in the example of star wars that, that's how i interpret that movie it, it's a bit of if you really watch it well it's a bit of a strange thing right what's going on there because his father is a sort of like evil guy but then the story is actually that luke is integrating the dark parts basically because at least that's the symbolism i'm taking from it so like yes his so this is all within the framework of like the the, the 12 steps right the monomyth the the joseph campbell hero story cycle mm -hmm. and and star wars is totally that and then he ends up in the in the crevasse he has this like shock and and rebirth thing going on there when he finally has the knowledge that like oh boy my my father is evil like how how am i going to handle this and, and what i think is like he's he's yeah he, 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 in order to like go on he has to like integrate these these bits of him that were repressed and that were 
not allowed and that remained in the shadow. And for me, it's clear because final episode is like in black. So he, in a way, he has become more of his father. He has already saved his father in a way, let's say. Like he's way more tricky in the final one, right? Like he's mm -hmm. way more, in a strange way, aggressive and going for his goal. And like, you know, in a way, he has become sort of like more of his father, but without losing his compassion. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And and this will be my final point and then we'll shut it down. But because as you said, I mean, you could think yeah. about these things in, you know, how how far can you actually logically think about these things? And perhaps that's part of the point of why stories have become so sticky. It's because, you know, where does it end if you just continue to add, like try to find another basement of, you know, another layer of the onion? Whereas if you are able to imbue a story with wisdom or perhaps flipping the direction there, if you're able to recognize how consciousness works in that narrative structure and say, you know, it, whether it's a religion or it's a myth or it's a movie or something like that, I'm going to imbue the story with these virtues, let's say, or, or with these, with the truth of how things operate and the story itself the narrative itself, the intrigue of the story will do all, will do the work for me surreptitiously, subconsciously, as we were kind of touching on earlier. So not perhaps the reason why stories and religion and myth are so sticky is because they achieve the same object, you know, they achieve the objective of kind of instilling in the, you know, people a proper mode of being a proper way of interfacing with the world, but not just through, you know, logic and reason and, uh, and in a manner that could go on forever, but in a concise, contained structure that delivered basically the the you know the important points, let's say, but did so in a way that was appealing and uh, ad adoptable by by consciousness. And and so perhaps there was people five thousand years ago that you know. The, that could really lay down like some great logic and reason philosophy about uh, philosophy about how all this stuff works, but it just wasn't sticky because it, it wasn't appreciating how awareness and consciousness and perception works as much as the stories have revealed uh, to us. They do. Yeah, perhaps. But uh, I think we can conclude that uh, The Wizard of Oz is a 100% a gold pilling <laughs> story, if, if you would agree, uh, uh, John. So uh, all Bitcoiners, uh, please uh, read the book. Uh, perhaps we could uh, put the link to Gutenberg in the description or something. Yeah, I'll, and, uh, I'll put the link in the I, show notes. I, yeah, and, and uh, I invite every Bitcoiner to, uh, to read it and uh, perhaps... Uh, rebuttal uh, uh, or rebuke our crazy arguments uh, we put out here today. Well, I, lo I look forward to that for sure. But I also look forward to the stories that come out of this new phenomenon, you know, and they've, it's already started. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did a, a, I had a podcast with Fractal Encrypt. And I don't know if you saw yeah. that he released the Time Chain Codex, which uses AI for all the art exclusively. Uh, and it's like a comic book, a hundred and 20 page comic book and it's and it, oh sorry it's based on drew bansall's um the bitcoin astronomy uh article. yeah with the about the hash horizon and, yeah yeah and it, yeah. i mean it so good it's just everything about it the imagery the story the fact that it's both educational and entertaining i mean just super super impressed and again i mean to me that's just another example of how this new paradigm and the changes and inspire how it's this new paradigm is inspiring people to create, you know, to articulate what's happening in various ways. And so I think we're going to see a lot of mythologizing, storytelling, narrativizing around the phenomenon that we're currently wrapped up in, in Bitcoin. And, you know, I can't wait to see it because I love all of it. I think it's so rich and it's so powerful and I love it. Correct. And, and and for myself, like I was so inspired by this Wizard of Oz story. I was just so intrigued by the surreptitiousness and accuracy that I'm also like um, currently writing a story where I'm looking to like reimagine this story. But then there you uh, go. 
for Bitcoin. So I'm also busy on that, like, just like a Fractal Encrypt. So um, awesome. Yeah, let's see uh, where that ends up. Yeah, well, I can't wait to read it whenever it ends and and uh, when it does, we'll have to come back on and and, and talk about it again. So, uh, man, I appreciate all the time you gave me today. Super uh, intriguing and interesting uh, conversation. Any final words, comments, shills before we shut it down? No, other than reading The Wizard of Oz, my main recommendation. That's, That's it. it. Those are my words. <laughs> all right, brother. Thanks again. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for having me. See ya.